Sergeants, can you please start your recordings? That's what treaties recordings are supposed to be. Sergeant Martinez, you may continue with your opening. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council joint hearing of the Committee on Education and the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or off. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Okay, good morning and welcome to today's virtual hearing. I am council member Mark Traeger, chair of the education committee. I'd like to thank my colleague, uh, council member Diana Ayala, chair of the committee on mental health, disabilities and addiction for holding this critically important joint hearing. Last week, the committee on education joined the health committee to examine the reopening of schools under a health and safety lens. Today's oversight topic is reopening New York City public schools impact on students with disabilities. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or IDEA ensures that students with disabilities are provided with free appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. IDEA enshrines in law that students with disabilities have the same educational rights and opportunities as their peers without disabilities. COVID-19 does not abdicate this responsibility. In fact, when the CARES Act was passed and the United States Department of Education was asked to recommend waivers to IDEA to meet the challenges created by COVID, the department did not recommend any changes to the core tenets of IDEA a free appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. The department held that through ingenuity, innovation and grit, educators and schools can continue to faithfully educate, um, educate every one of its students. Students with disabilities account for approximately 20% of the 1.1 million students in New York City school system. Yet only 84% of students with disabilities are receiving their services uh, in their IEPs in full, and they graduate at lower rates than their non-disabled peers, drop out of school at higher rates and have a much lower reading proficiency. And that was before COVID-19 hit this country. That bears worth repeating despite IDEA, those data points are from when schools were functioning prior to the pandemic. COVID-19 has shown a bright light on the inequities we knew already existed and will only worsen the academic achievement of students with disabilities. All throughout the summer months as the debate around school reopening raged across this country, I argued forcefully that the administration carefully and prudently reopened New York City schools and to do so with full funding available and to follow the science. I released my own school reopening proposal on July 24th. In that proposal, I called for a phased reopening of New York City schools with a priority on early childhood and elementary school students for in-person instruction five days a week with the option to opt out. And that was to also include children with IEPs. The mayor of course has his own plan and own proposal. Well, several different plans as the reopening of schools worked forward like, like a broken uh, down car on the highway. Everyone understands the unprecedented challenges faced in March. No district was prepared for a full system shutdown necessitating immediate remote learning. But it is October 23rd, 2020. We had all spring and summer to figure things out. 
DOE engage the services of a consultant agency. The mayor recently declared all is well. However, recent and frequent mayoral mishaps prove otherwise. All is not well for any of our city's 1.1 million students, and it is definitely not nowhere near well for our students with disabilities who have already been historically neglected under the current education system. I acknowledge it at last week's hearing and I will, I will do so here again. I appreciate the hard work of our chancellor, his senior cabinet, many in DOE central staff, school leaders, teachers, paraprofessionals, custodians, in our entire school communities, all, all the school-based staff for their, for their hard work that they have put in, again, especially at the school level when they have to operationalize everything. Um, especially those employees on the ground trying to make sense of everything for our students and their families. No one can deny that they are not trying to make this work, but they are hampered by micromanaging, by a micromanaging mayor who can't either see the issues or simply refuses to acknowledge them. Today's hearing is about coming clean and providing answers to questions to shed a, a harsh light on the impact this pandemic has had on students with disabilities. These committees want to know the services being received, the safety measures being taken, the accommodations being given to students with disabilities as it pertains to mandates like face coverings or mask wearing and social distancing. We sent the administration a list of questions for today's hearing on, on Tuesday with an updated list sent yesterday. I look forward to all questions being answered here today on the record. For those gaps in services and, and technology that are identified, and there will be, I know that I and my colleague, Chair Ayala, uh, look forward with anticipation to hear remedial steps the department is engaging in to remedy the situation. The last, uh, the, the lost learning from this past spring, coupled with the learning gaps being experienced right now by students with disabilities, means the administration and the DOE must do a lot more must redouble their efforts to provide students with disabilities and education equivalent to their non-disabled peers. I wanna thank everyone who is testifying today. I wanna to thank the city council staff for all their hard work they put into this hearing. Malcolm Butehorn, Jan Atwell, Kalima Johnson, Chelsea Betamore, Macy Sarkissian, Melissa Nunez, and Rose Martinez. I also wanna thank my chief of staff, Anna Scaife, and my policy director, uh, Vanessa Ogle. Uh, and with that, I want to recognize the council members who are, who are here so far and then turn over to my colleague. Uh, we're, we've been joined so far by council members Rose, Cabrera, Credenchik, Lewis, Kalos, uh, Levine, Brennan, Barron, Ampri Samuel, and Borelli. Uh, and with that, I will now turn it over to my co chair, council member Diana Ayala. Thank you, Chair Traeger. Good morning, everyone. I am Council Member Diana Ayala, Chair of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addiction. First, I would like to thank Chair Traeger for co-chairing today's important hearing. I would also like to thank and acknowledge all of my fellow committee members who are here with us today at this remote hearing. In the best of times, the issues faced by the almost 231,000 New York City public school students with disabilities can present a variety of daily challenges. In some cases, despite the performance improvements, Students with disabilities have not always been able to keep pace with their non-disabled peers because they have not been able to access a full complement of services that they are entitled to receive. For many, the COVID-19 pandemic has only highlighted and amplified these disparities. In fact, the transition to a remote learning environment has exacerbated educational and instructional disparities for many of our most vulnerable students. Remote learning simply does not work for all students. Particularly, it may not work for all students with disabilities. Some students with disabilities may require additional supplies, equipment, or material that they simply do not have at home or that their families cannot afford to purchase. Some students with disabilities may be unable to comfortably sit in front of a screen with blue light for many hours a day. Some students with disabilities may require a parent, guardian, or an adult to sit with them and assist them with remote learning, which places an impossible burden on working families. Additionally, many students receive, um, service, receive services, including physical occupational therapy and speech therapies that simply cannot be properly or adequately delivered via remote access. These services often require equipment or a hands-on approach. 
According to a recent study, among schools with hybrid schedules providing in-person instruction one to three days a week, with remote instructions being provided on other days, only 39% of the 150,000 students entitled to receive special services are able to access them on a regular basis. For students attending in-person schools, they may be returning to, to a school environment that is unfamiliar and frightening to them. Masked classmates and teachers, random medical testing without a familiar adult in the room, and an underlying fear of contracting a virus. These changes are scary for all children and students, but may be particularly challenging for students with cognitive impairment or autism spectrum disorders. Finally, a shortage of power professionals and nurses to accompany District 75 students on yellow school buses have made it impossible for many students to get to school at all. As the Department of Education faces the challenges of finding sufficient staff to provide in-person related services for students with disabilities, we need to ensure that students don't regress due to the lack of in-person services and support, not only during the pandemic, but well beyond this crisis. So that, so that going forward, there is a better system of educational service delivery waiting for all of our students, including those with disabilities. I wanna thank the representatives from the administration who are here today and look forward to hearing about their commitment to ensuring that a quality education is accessible to all New York City public school students. I also look forward to hearing about what is being done to ensure that these services are delivered when and where they are needed and the role that the city council can play in supporting those efforts. I also want to thank my colleagues as well as my committee staff, senior counsel Sarah Liss, legislative policy analyst Christy Dwyer, Finance Analyst Lauren Hunt, my Deputy Chief of Staff Michelle Cruz, my Chief of Staff Jose Rodriguez for making this hearing possible. Thank you all and I look forward to a great discussion. I now turn it back to the Committee Council. Thank you, Chairs. Um, I'm going to go over some procedural items. So thank you, Chairs Traeger and uh, Chair Ayala. I'm Malcolm Butehorn, Counsel to the Education Committee of the New York City Council. I'm also joined today by my colleague, Sara Liss, counsel to the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addictions. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. After you are called on, you will then be unmuted. I will be calling on witnesses to testify in panels, so please listen for your name to be called. I would like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, while you will be placed on a panel, I will be calling individuals to testify one at a time. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raised hand function in Zoom and you will be called on in the order with which you raised your hand after the full panel has completed testimony. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. This includes both questions and answers. And for purposes of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questioning. For panelists for public testimony, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. Please listen for that cue. All public testimony will be limited to two minutes. At the end of two minutes, please wrap up your comments so we can move to the next panelist. Please listen carefully and wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. Dr. Linda Chen, Chief Academic Officer, Christina Fodi, Deputy Chief Academic Officer, John Hammer, Deputy Chief Executive Director of the Special Education Office, Resi Dunn, Chief Strategy Officer, Lauren Siciliano, Deputy Chief Operating Officer, Sean Fitzpatrick, Senior Executive Director, Office of Pupil Transportation, Catherine Jebrlinick, Chief of Staff, Division of School Climate and Wellness. Elizabeth Stranzel, Director of Policy, Division of School Climate and Wellness. And Emily Liss, Chief Operating Officer, Early Childhood Education and Student Enrollment. I will first read the oath and after I will call on each of you uh, to, respond individually, uh, to respond individually. If you could all please raise your right hand and make sure your video is activated. Do you affirm to tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions. Dr. Chen? Yes. Christina Fodi? Yes. John Hammer? Yes. Resi Dunn? 
Yes. Lauren Siciliano. Yes. Sean Fitzpatrick. Yes. Catherine Jerlinick, and I apologize if I messed up your last name. That's fine, yes. Elizabeth Stranzel. She's not on. Okay, and Emily Liss. We can come back to her if she answers questions later. Uh, thank you. Um, finally, for question time, due to the large number of administ administration officials present, any panelists that will be answering questions after Dr. Chen and Ms. Fodi, if you could please state your name before you speak, therefore we'll make it clear in the official transcript who is speaking. Dr. Chen and Ms. Fodi, you may begin when ready. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chairs Traeger and Ayala, and all the members of the Education and Mental Health Disabilities and Addictions Committees here today. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Department of Education's reopening implementation as it relates to special education. And thank you to Chairs Traeger and Ayala, as well as the members of both committees for your continued advocacy on behalf of all of our students and particularly our students with disabilities. I am Linda Chen, the Chief Academic Officer for the DOE, and I'm joined today by Christina Foti, our Deputy Chief Academic Officer for Specialized Instruction and Student Support. Also joining me today are Lauren Siciliano, Chief Administrative Officer, Reese Dunn, Chief Strategy Officer in the Office of the First Deputy Chancellor, Sean Fitzpatrick, Senior Executive Officer for the Office of Pupil Transportation, and members of the Special Education Department who are extraordinarily talented and dedicated to the work of serving our students with disabilities. Together, we look forward to the opportunity to share more about the work we are doing and to answer any questions that you might have today. In a moment, Christina will share a more detailed account of the DOE's efforts to support our students with individualized education programs or IEPs and their families during these unprecedented times. I wanna start by sharing an overview of what we have been doing, been able to accomplish in partnership with our families and educators and with the support of the city council. This administration is committed to meeting the needs of roughly 200,000 students with disability in community school districts and in District 75 or D75. Since March, students with IEPs have been at the forefront of our planning, both for blended learning last spring and for return in person school and services. As soon as the pandemic started, our priority for each and every student was their health and safety and the continued provision of high quality education. For most vulnerable students, including our students with disabilities, this meant prioritizing them for iPad distribution and in-person services. We have delivered over 100,000 iPads to students with IEPs and continue to prioritize such requests. Students with IEPs were the first group of students to receive in-person supports as soon as we could when we opened sites for related service provision this past July. And students with the most intensive needs were the first to return to school this September when we opened our doors for D75 and early childhood as the initial step of tiered reopening. The pandemic has had the greatest impact on students with the greatest needs. The challenge of reopening during a pandemic has been enormous, but also the rewards are already clear in the responses of our students and families. We will continue to do all we can to meet their individual needs with as much in-person school as possible and through enhancement to remote learning programs and support for our families at home. I would now like to turn the time over to Christina Foti, who can provide additional details on our efforts. Christina. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Before I begin, I would also like to thank Chairs Traeger and Ayala for your continued leadership on throughout this pandemic and all that you have done on behalf of our students and families. I would also like to thank the families of our students with IEPs. So many of us have had to make difficult decisions about how to best support and protect our loved ones during this time. We know that for parents and caregivers of children with disabilities, these decisions can be extremely complex with the stakes even greater. 
Our goal is to ensure that every student has the supports and services they need to thrive. And our commitment to that goal is stronger than ever. Our strategy for support, supporting families of students with disabilities during the pandemic has been centered on two key principles, continuity of service for students and support to their families. Recognizing the impact that school closure would have on our students with disabilities, especially, the DOE moved quickly in March to deliver special education programs and related services remotely. The massive effort included development of the detailed procedures for schools on how to communicate with families to review and schedule services, developmental, development of clinical and technological training guidance for effective delivery of remote services, and provision of de devices and other supports necessary to move around 200,000 students to remote learning within a week of school closing. I could not be more proud of our related service providers, supervisors, and managers who led the efforts to ensure that our students continued to receive their services from home. Since March, our providers have delivered nearly 3 million remote sessions of speech therapy occupational therapy, physical therapy, and counseling. Since March, we have kept in touch with families through over 120,000 remote IEP meetings, and we continue to monitor and respond to parent inquiries via our special education at schools.nyc.gov inbox, as well as 311. We have heard, acknowledged, and supported families in a multitude of settings. And we have found it critical in a system as large as ours that we develop additional opportunities for families to express their concerns, their frustrations, their victories, and their questions. Addressing challenges alongside our families has been a focus of ours. And while there's still much work to do and engagement to be had, this has and will continue to be a priority of our office and of the department. During the spring, at the time the DOE pivoted to remote learning, we began to plan for the safe delivery, for the, for the safe return to delivery of in-person instruction and related services, understanding that for some students with IEPs, in-person service is critical to maintaining progress in language, as well as physical and social and emotional development. We developed comprehensive safe and health and safety protocols and training for our speech language, occupational and physical therapy providers and identified 12 school sites, at least two in each borough where we could offer these in-person supports. This began in July. New York City was the only major urban school district in the nation to provide in-person services over the summer. Through the combined efforts of our staff and families who opted in, we served 625 students and did so safely. Our planning for summer paved the way for us to resume in-person instruction and service provision during blended learning this fall. New York has been ahead of other cities in providing special education instruction and related services in person. We have allowed maximum flexibility for our parents to choose blended or full-time remote learning for children at any time. 47% of our students with disabilities have elected the blended learning option. For some students with more intensive needs, we have been able to offer full-time return to school Monday through Friday every week while observing all health and safety guidelines. The positive effect for students returning to school has in fact been immeasurable. Still for the vast majority of our students, remote learning continues at least in part. Despite many achievements in implementing remote learning this past spring, we recognize that fam families faced substantial challenges. To address concerns families raised in the spring, we worked with our labor partners to deliver clear expectations for synchronous learning for students receiving fully remote instruction. Perhaps the proudest moment of my 20 year career in education was being able to greet our students at P811M, a District 75 school on their first day back. This is the school where I began my teaching career and I know firsthand how deeply the administration and the staff care for their students. I am grateful to our mayor, chancellor, and our labor partners who led the efforts to ensure that District 75 schools had the PPE guidance and resources they need in order to successfully lead the reopening efforts. Our experience so far has proven that, we, that this work can be done safely and effectively. There is no question that District 75 schools faced unique staffing and scheduling limitations this fall. The DOE developed new policies and procedures to address them and to provide schools serving our students with IEPs appropriate support. 
First, in an effort to strengthen communication with families about our current service delivery models, the DOE designed the program adaptations document, which we will refer to in this hearing as the PAD, to provide detailed information on the provision of each student's special education programs and to ensure that parents can provide updates and share feedback on their child's experience with remote learning. Understanding that parents are a critical part of this process, we've built in safeguards to ensure that schools seek parent participation in the development of the PAD. We have also issued guidance to schools on the provision of speech language therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and counseling services through blended and remote learning. This guidance developed in response to parent feedback from the spring emphasizes that related services are expected to be provided in the frequency and duration recommended on the IEP whenever possible. This policy also instructs schools to work with families to accommodate requests for in-person services as much as possible, consistent with safety and health protocols. Related service providers have been contacting families to discuss the provision of services and documented, documenting the agreed upon plan by completing a related service adaptations document, which we will refer to in this hearing as the RAD. To further assist families with understanding remote services and supporting the, their children's education at home, the DOE Special Education Office developed and launched the Beyond Access series on June 1st. These live one hour sessions share information around special education practices based on feedback from families and advocates, as well as the Citywide Council for Special Education and the Citywide Council for District 75. To date, we have hosted 13 sessions covering topics around instructional strategies, sensory supports, supporting students with autism spectrum disorder and many more. We will continue to offer the Beyond Access series monthly throughout the school year. As future sessions are scheduled, we will announce them on the DOE's website and share them, share them with our community partners. Families can access past sessions on the DOE website with captions in 35 languages. This series has created a new avenue for sharing information with families and is a best practice that we hope to continue after the pandemic. We have developed extensive guidance for schools on the provision of special education programs through blended and fully remote learning for integrated co-teaching or ICT classes, the guidance makes clear that classes have a general education teacher and a special education teacher. For special education teacher support services, also known as SETs, we have guided schools to work with families to determine whether SETs can effectively be delivered remotely. This allows students to remain with their class for the duration of in-person school days while continuing to receive their full special education programs. For students recommended for bilingual special education programs, we have emphasized the need for schools to provide access to language supports through translated texts and materials and through the use of bilingual paraprofessionals, both in person and remotely for students who do not have a certified bilingual special education teacher. We have also expanded our Nest and Horizon programs for students with autism spectrum disorder for the 2021 school year to support students continuing into middle and high school. Students in ASD programs are receiving the supports and services the programs are designed to deliver. We have worked with our partners and various stakeholders to adapt and modify interventions and strategies for blended and remote learning. In welcoming our students back to school, either in a blended or remote setting, we recognize and we expect that re regression and learning loss will likely impact many kids both in general education settings and special education settings. To guide schools in supporting students with IEPs, we have developed training for special educators and IEP teams to facilitate effective progress monitoring to identify and address learning loss. Progress monitoring assists educators in making ongoing instructional decisions and refinements to a student's program and provides summative evidence that enables IEP teams to determine whether students have achieved their annual goals the DOE Special Education Office provided a training module on progress monitoring to all schools as part of the pre fall pre-service and will continue to offer training and support during the 2021 school year. Finally, I would like to highlight that our efforts in the areas of literacy supports and transition. The DOE is committed to providing literacy supports to our students with disabilities. This past summer, additional special education teachers were allocated to provide literacy supports to students with IEPs in grades three through eight and using an evidence-based literacy program. 
Teachers serve students individually or in small groups synchronously for up to 30 minutes a day per session. Through this effort, approximately 1300 students received additional literacy support in addition to their regular summer school program. This fall, 960 schools have been allocated a centrally funded IEP teacher position. The IEP teacher is dedicated to, to providing evidence-based literacy instruction to students with IEPs and students at risk, both in person and remotely. Trainings for new educa educators in this position have started this week, October 19th, and will continue throughout the school year. The DOE is committed to working with families to ensure that every student with an IEP has a post-secondary plan in place and is supported in achieving that plan. We have opened a transition in college access center in each borough to provide students and schools and families with information, resources, training, consultancy, work-based learning opportunities and other services as needed to support a successful transition to college, career and or independent living. When the DOE transitioned to remote learning, TCACs continued to provide services to schools and families remotely. For students who were preparing to graduate or transition out of school at age 21, the pandemic disrupted education and transition planning at a critical point. To ensure that these students were not left in limbo, we extended eligibility for students to continue school over the summer or to receive a transition consultancy services from our TCACs as needed. This school year, any student who did not achieve their IP goals, goals showed signs of regression or missed instruction and or services due to the pandemic and who does not yet have a post-secondary plan in place is in fact eligible to return to school. While we recognize that the last seven months have been extremely challenging for students and families, the DOE's commitment to our students with disabilities has been unwavering throughout this trying time. I testify here today to share some of the highlights and learnings from our shared experiences and to recognize that there is still a tremendous amount of work to be done. My team and I remain committed to two key, the two key principles that have been our compass during this time, continuity of services for students and support for their families. We commit to continuing to strengthen family and community engagement efforts through our partnerships, both internal and external, and by sharing information with families in a timely matter manner. We remain committed to closing the achievement gap and graduation gap for our students with IEPs. And we will continue to work tirelessly until the day that we achieve full program and related services, service provision for all students across the city. We welcome these, the partnership of these committees in our pursuit of these goals. And I thank you today and I'm happy to address any questions that you have. Thank you, Ms. Roche. I just want to also just mention that we have also been joined by council members Rodriguez, uh, Levin, and, uh, and Rosenthal. Um, so I, I will begin with, uh, with questions. Um, of the total number of students who have uh, opted for blended learning um, for some in-person services, how many are children with IEPs? So um, Chair, just I just want to clarify the question, how many students? Yes, of, of the total number of students who have opted for the blended hybrid model, uh, how many of them are children with IEPs? Let me just my make sure I have that information so we um, there are students who have opted for remote only um, in our families I don't have the numbers right here at my fingertips can I come back to you with that one I'm, I'm I apologize sir yeah uh, make sure I give you the right numbers right um, and just the difference just between Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it, because it's my understanding that um, under half of the total number of kids in our school system have chosen for the blended learning model. It would be uh, helpful uh, I don't know if I, when you can get me the number that you have as of this moment, how many of, the, of those children who opted uh, for uh, hybrid or blended are children with IEPs? 
And so when, when you get that, if you could circle back with me, I would appreciate it. Okay. Um, so it's the, about 400, sorry, for about 471 of the roughly two, sorry. Let me just 47%, sorry, of the roughly 200 students. So it's, it's similar to what you're saying for overall students, but it's about 47% of the 200,000 roughly. So about 47% of the 200,000 students. So it's under 100, okay. Um, do you have, because these are some questions I asked last week and um, the DOE mentioned that they would get back to us and just trying to, gonna, gonna re-up these questions. Um, what percentage of students are not receiving their full IEP mandates? So we, as you know, endeavor to ensure that every student is receiving their services. I'm gonna ask Christina to just give us uh, a little bit more in terms of the particulars around the service provision. Give us one moment, Ms. Fodi, sorry. Thank you for unmuting me. Um, thank you for the question. Service provision to our students with, with our students with disabilities is a top priority. We are committed to delivering our special education programs and services. Um, as you know, and as we discussed yesterday, Chair, Chair um, we are currently, uh, we've developed two components that we are using to track program provision and related service provision. And the documents that we're using to, tra to track that are the, I'm so sorry, I have an echo. Are you able to hear me? I can hear you. Okay. I apologize. I'm getting distracted by my echo. No worries. Okay. So, Chair, we, we discussed um, our reporting obligations in terms of program services and related services, and uh, we are fully committed to providing those program and related services uh, throughout this pandemic. We closed out last year um, at 83% full and partial service. In your testimony, you mentioned that the year prior, we were about 84.5%, and that is correct. Um, you know, we were on target to, to surpass that number pre-pandemic um, and are going to be, as I testified, making every, every effort to get to 100%. The program adaptations document that I mentioned during my testimony is a key component to service provision this year, recognizing that our students with IEPs have IEPs that were designed for a school environment. We want to make sure that we're capturing the blended learning services and the remote services that our students are receiving this year. And so the, um, we will be providing updated information on our current levels, but uh, as, as of June, we, we ended the school year with 83% of our students with disabilities fully and partially served. And I apologize for the, uh, the uh, echo at the beginning of this, but I'm glad you can't hear it. Actually, if Dr. Chen, could you just lower the volume on your computer? Because I think it's what feedback is coming in on Christina Fodes. Thank you. Um, so just to be clear, and, and Ms. Fodes, I do want to just note for the record that um, each time I reach out to Ms. Foti to get um, answers for folks in my district and uh, emails I get from parents and educators, she is very responsive to me. And I, I do appreciate that. I wanna just note that for the record that you have been very helpful and accessible. Um, I, I, I do just wanna just get further clar clarification. Um, you mentioned that uh, you are on track to, to update the committee and the council on the percentage. When can we expect to receive the number, the percentage of students now who are not receiving their full IEP mandates. When can we expect to get that number? Sure. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for that feedback. I, I uh, certainly appreciate the all of you 
the contact you have made on behalf of your families. And it is a real joy and pleasure to uh, support families throughout the city. Um, but thank you for the acknowledgement. Um, we are on track for, uh, we certainly owe the council uh, reporting data, a report of data for the end of the school year. And we are on track uh, to release that data publicly uh, for November, our November due date, due, due date that we have with the council. Um, and we are going to meet that due date. Uh, as far as reporting is concerned um, for the, uh, this current school year, uh, again, we recognize the urgency and the importance of getting the information out and our, we have a deep desire to make that as transparent and accessible and accessible as possible to our families. Um, we, I do not have a deadline for this year's reports uh, at the moment, but we are very much working on integrating that data and our ability to report. You know, we have certainly, um, pre-pandemic, we certainly got to a place where uh, our reporting was, was becoming uh, much more lockstep and quick. Um, and during the pandemic, we've had different metrics that we've needed to build reporting modules based on. And so we are uh, committed to providing that data. Um, and I will get back to you with a date that we will have that by. I mean, I, I, this is crucial because we need this information to know, to know where to target more support. I mean, kids are experiencing crisis. I think you as, a, you as an educator, I, I know you get this. The, the, the mayor's office, the mayor himself, um, I don't think captures the gravity of this crisis for, for, for these children and their families. This is time that they'll never get back and they are regressing and we, we need to have this information because my next question, just to, to, to add to this, um, and I, I imagine that you that folks are tracking this or getting or keeping tabs on this. What percentage of special education classrooms, like ICT, are not properly staffed, um, either with special education licensed teachers or proper ratio of teacher to student? Thank you for unmuting me. Um, Chair, I'm sorry, I just wanted to correct uh, the number that I just provided you earlier. Um, what I had said earlier is, is the 83% I shared represents full service last year. I was using that as a comparable and um, uh, number to what you had used in your, your testimony around the 84% of full service. If we were to combine our full and partial service provision, we were at 98% full and partial provision. While that is a, certainly a, a better number, we are committed to getting to 100%. And to your earlier comments, we certainly uh, recognize the urgency around providing that information um, in the current school year and are committed to doing uh, so, so as quickly as possible. Can you repeat your question uh, on ICT? Yeah, uh, and also just kind of note, I, I, we have over 200,000 students in our school system with IEPs. So even like when we use the language of 84%, 85%, that's still thousands of kids not yes. getting what they're legally entitled to receive. So I just wanna just give that context. Um, what percentage of special education classrooms such as ICT are not properly staffed uh, with either special education licensed teachers or the proper teacher to student ratio? Sure. So, uh, Chair, that is that is part of the uh, reporting and analytics uh, that that we are working on, um, and we certainly uh, are currently our staffing has been worked out at the local level um, and is being managed by our principals and our superintendents, and they are doing um, uh, a wonderful job of of pivoting and being flex flexible and and providing the supports and services that our students so desperately need. I know that we are uh, navigating uh, an enormous number of um, staffing complexities. And I would love to invite my colleague, Lauren Siciliano, who is our chief administrative officer to talk about our, our efforts uh, that we are making on to fill any staffing shortages in the field. And if we could please unmute Lauren.
just bear with us. Sorry, it seems we're a little lagging today. Just give us one moment. Good morning. Thank you, Christina, and thank you, Chair Traeger, for the opportunity to talk about what we are doing to support special education teacher hiring. Um, as you know, this is always a priority area for us in terms of teacher recruitment, uh, and we have several programs that are uh, explicitly focused on recruiting uh, teachers for students with disabilities. Um, that includes several alter alternative certification programs that we have um, that are focused on recruiting uh, teachers of students with disabilities. We also offer direct scholarships and loan forgiveness programs um, for many of our higher need uh, shortage areas, as well as um, support for paraprofessionals to become certified as teachers of students with disabilities, and uh, in particular supporting um, teachers receive extensions for bilingual certification as well, uh, in addition to teaching our students with disabilities. We also work very closely with our local university education partners um, to recruit uh, teachers into those licenses. So, Mrs. Siliano, at, and I appreciate uh, you being here with us today. Uh, at the last hearing, I had asked the chancellor and the first deputy chancellor a question that they uh, that the first deputy chancellor mentioned he would get back to us right away on. We have not heard back, to my knowledge, on the um, the, the breakdown of the, the staff who have been granted medical accommodations as far as the staff shortage. We were asking for the number of teachers uh, that you're short by, the number of power professionals that you're short by, um, school psychologists, social workers, and so forth. Do you have that information with you today? So in terms of the medical accommodations, I do believe we shared that breakdown, but I will make sure that that gets over to you. Um, we do have the breakdown by title for the reasonable accommodations. Can you share on the record or do you have that? Um, I don't have it in front of me, but I will make sure that we get it to you. Yeah, and I, uh, to my knowledge, I have not received it. If staff have received it, I, I will ask them to forward it. I see Malcolm was shaking his head. So if they could send it to me, I'd be happy to share it with the public. Uh, I have not, to my knowledge, I have not received uh, any, any update on that. And we need to know, um, and I wanna make it very clear for the public why we need to know. This is not a game of gotcha with the administration. We need to know where the needs are so we can fight like hell for more resources and staff for our kids. That's what this is about. It's the same issue with devices and internet. It's not a game of gotcha. This is about meeting the needs of our kids who have, for months have not had devices, internet, and critical mandated services. Um, and and I, again, I, I lay fault squarely with the mayor because he has been in denial about how severe this crisis is. So we need to know what the staffing shortage number is because my next question, you know, and again, I have more questions related to staffing. Um, what percentage of students have begun their mandated related services? Does anyone know that? Chair, I can, I can certainly uh, speak to this topic. Um, as you know, related services are critical to the advancement of our uh, students and meeting their academic uh, goals. Um, one of the things I spoke about in my opening testimony was uh, the efforts we're making to make sure that we are urgently documenting uh, those related service plans um, and provision of our related services. Uh, we are proud of that we ended last spring with uh, students fully and partially encountered receiving their related services at 95%. Any students that did not receive those related services were issued RSAs um, because we do, as you have pointed out, have an obligation to reach that 100% mark. We are currently in the process of finalizing the receipt of those related service plans. As you know, much of uh, programming uh, it has been moving at the school level, but we are concretizing 
uh, the provision of services and will be able to report fully on both uh, the provision of related services and program services shortly, as I mentioned earlier. So Ms. Foti, I'm gonna respectfully push back. Yeah. Uh, the council actually had to subpoena information from the DOE about attendance engagement levels from the spring. We were supposed to get it you know, right after my May hearing. We didn't, get, we didn't get it until we issued a subpoena. And again, I understand that City Hall does not like to share information that's not flattering for the education department. But to me, this is not about what's flattering or not. This is about whether we're meeting the needs of our kids or not and to allocate resources and push for resources to, to meet their needs. Um, and what we saw from the attendance data from spring was damning, damning, for, especially for communities that have been marginalized and shortchanged prior to the pandemic, certainly uh, even more shortchanged during the pandemic. I mean, we, <laughs> there are kids who still haven't even had a device. There are kids where they still don't have internet access. Uh, I met with a family um, uh, living in a shelter who cannot connect to internet. And there are, are many families, uh, with children with IEPs where this is just not working for them. And we're not getting any type of meaningful feedback on how to improve services. I, I wanna also ask just to add to the queue about staffing. Um, what, do you have a percentage of students, are you tracking a percentage of students who are mandated to receive, but have not yet been assigned a power professional. So Chair, I, 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 I just wanted to respond quickly to uh, the question you the comments you made earlier. Ms. Ms. Foti, uh, there is now a strong echo. So yeah. just want to just note that. Okay. I think if you're sharing the same room, if one of you would mute while the other one is speaking, it'll it'll help with the echo. You should be okay to go now. Thank you so much. Chair, I just wanted to acknowledge your comments earlier. I'm still getting the echo. Sorry. Okay. Um, what we'll do is, uh, Dr. Tam, we'll just have to keep you muted while Ms. Foti speaks and vice versa. So um, just look for when we do unmute you. You'll get that message, and then we'll unmute you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, just... I, I want to acknowledge that none of none of this is flattering until we reach 100% chair. Um, and so, uh, this is where we are we are on the same page around um, the commitment to getting to 100%. Uh, I do want to say that in terms of engagement uh, of our students with disabilities in the spring, our engagement data reflects that um, the vast majority of our students were actively engaged and connected uh, to their schools during the spring. Um, and that is a true testament of the work of our principals and of our incredibly skilled special educators, of the parent coordinators, um, and all of the outreach efforts to make sure that our students with disabilities are feel connected and heard and seen in their school communities. And so I, well, I agree that nothing less than 100% is, is flattering. Um, I am, uh, I, I, it is, it behooves me to, to point out the incredible and Herculean efforts of our schools to make sure that they maintained a consistent con point of content and engagement with our students with disabilities in the spring. And that is something that I, that I feel strongly needs to be uh, acknowledged. So Ms. Forte, I, I appreciate the answer. I, I, I will kind of dig deeper on the DOE's definition of, of attendance and engagement. Um, this is something that I have long argued that there's a big difference between being compliant and being engaged. And to me, uh, while pressing a button on a screen does not mean a kid is engaged or so, but can the DOE provide a clear answer for, for the committee, for the committees and, and, and council um, on what being marked present means 
for students with disabilities? What level of participation is required for a student with disability to be more present for remote learning? And is this a uniform policy across all schools? Yes, Chair, this is uh, the attendance policy applies to all students, including our students with disabilities and is a uniform policy across schools. As a special educator, um, I can say that, uh, and I think, and I know you know this well, that uh, it is critical for us to know our students well, to know their strengths, to know their interests, to know their passions, and to know what they struggle with. And what we built and, and what we, um, we built our, our policies and processes around engagement that will foster that, which is why we have gone uh, to the lengths that we have to ensure that our, our students in addition to their individual education plans that are roughly 200,000 students are also receiving plans for how remote and blended and uh, learning will be conducted and plans for how related services will be conducted in this unprecedented time. Um, that, that is, we are doing that to ensure that, um, uh, that our efforts to connect are not perfunctory, that they are in fact in alignment with uh, this incredible desire that we all have to ensure that our students are making ongoing progress and are connected and cared for by their schools. And we have seen incredible evidence of that. So just to clarify for us, because you know, and I did speak to you about this and I just wanna just kind of clarify for the public. Um, we had received feedback from one District 75 school where folks were told if the teacher spoke to the parent but did not connect with the student, that the student was being marked present, even though there was no connection made to the student. Can you just clarify, does that constitute being marked present uh, in a class? No, Chair, that does not constitute. Uh, uh, being marked present. I, I, our students need to be benefiting and engaged from their ongoing learning. Um, and that is not, uh, we certainly would want more engagement than that to ensure uh, that we account for that, uh, that attendance. Uh, Ms. Foti, do you have information with you today? Um, how many students with IEPs have entered this new school year with an in progress or incomplete grade from spring or summer. And to be, I'm asking for the number, uh, not percentage. Sir, I, 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 under, I understand why th that number is important. Um, that is not a, a number I have today um, with me today, but I can tell you uh, that we recognize that uh, that learning loss is a real issue during this pandemic and that the guidance that we are giving to our schools is that we actively progress monitor um, students and uh, really attend to any gaps uh, that are there. And we are working on uh, guidance. Uh, we have given out guidance and working on additional guidance for our special educators as well as our IEP teams in the event that we need to adjust the programs and services students are being provided in order to uh, attend to um, any, any areas of, of incomplete work or lack of progress as a result of the pandemic. So, but does someone, is someone keeping track of this? Is someone centrally keeping track of the number of kids with IEPs who have been given a grade of in progress or incomplete? Malcolm. Thank thank you for thank you for unmuting me, uh, Chair. Yes, thank you for the question around the course in progress. I think is the mark that you're referring to. Um, yeah. So we do um, centrally track that for all of our students, and it is also available. Uh, that information our principals are tracking as well and coordinating with teachers to follow up. Um, we are also um, providing that report for superintendents so that there's another layer of checking on students as well. Um, but I do want to make sure we can provide you the numbers. Uh, as Christine said, we don't have the numbers with us in front of us today, but I will provide that for you through um, uh, Roberto. But, but Dr. Chen, uh, have you seen those numbers yourself? Yes. Do they concern you? Are they absolutely. 
Any, if, if the number were one, it would concern me to be very frank with you, because what we have experienced, what all of our families have experienced in the pandemic is, and especially um, I think remarks were made by both you and Chair Ayala around this exacerbating disparities uh, for our most vulnerable, vulnerable learners. And it does concern me, but I also know that um, there is a window for students to be able to complete this. So any course in progress, students have um, a, essentially another semester to complete this. So we are still in that space. Our first pass at this was certainly in the summer. Um, we were, um, we, we invited all students with course in progress to be able to complete this in the summer. Um, and if you may recall, we also uh, really prioritize our seniors as well to, so that they could have August uh, graduation. And then now our educators, now that they are back in school or in remote, are also following up with students in course in progress. So it is to be expected that we wouldn't see 100% of these reconciled at this point because they do have the semester to be able to complete this. Dr. But Chen, our, our schools active. are tracking this information because it is important. We've lost, there has been unfinished learning from the spring and you're absolutely right. It is a concern. Is it accurate that students were told that they and their families have been told that they have until January 2021 to complete the standards? That is, uh, yes, as I said, they basically have a semester to complete this. So my concern here, I mean, we don't have enough information. First, I mean, I, I think we have enough, enough information to know that many of our children are not getting their mandated services. We still don't have, you know, how numbers as, as to how severe the staffing shortage is. And under, public needs to understand that the staffing shortage disproportionately impacts children uh, with special needs and, and other, other um, uh, student populations. Um, and it's my understanding that the DOE has not put forth a uniform citywide grading policy and there are a number of concerns I've heard from families about, you know, re regression, but also just just punitive actions, you know, term, towards academic performance that will have generational impacts and not just temporary impacts. Um, so I'm greatly concerned about this. Um, if you can get us that information, Dr. Chen, um, I would appreciate it as, as soon as soon as folks can because. We need to know what are the school, what is the DOE's plan to address these students with who are who have been given this course in progress or incomplete grade that they have until January to make up when we know for a fact that many of them are not getting the services uh, which they are entitled to. I mean, are, are there are conversations underway in DOE to communicate with schools about how to address the fact that I, I, I suspect, again, I don't have data, I suspect the number is very concerning. And these are numbers that we have always monitored as far as even before the pandemic, as far as how kids are graduating, which was also concerning, but I, I am very concerned about this. So I, I would appreciate folks getting back to, to the committee on, on that number. Um, I wanna just quickly, a couple more, and I wanna to turn to my co-chair. Um, uh, does the DOE keep track? Do you have like an average uh, day or days of service that children with IEPs have as far as in person? For example, anecdotally, I hear that some schools have developed their reopening model where certain ch children with IEPs might have more than one day of in person services. And there are certain schools that because of staffing shortages only have one day or two days. Does anyone keep track of on average, how many days of in-person services uh, children with special needs receive? Sure, I'll, I'll begin this chair and then also Reese Dunn from the office of the first deputy chancellor is on as well. And I'll have him add to this response as well. So um, as you probably recall, we've been trying to ever since the spring think about different models of returning to school. 
and and I know you know this very well in the particular schools on the ground staffing and attend and, and student engagement in fully remote or blended learning also varies from school to school in each community. And so what we try to do is to make sure that there were models that uh, could convey citywide consistency for all families while also allowing principals with their school communities making some of those some of those decisions in terms of programming models at the local level. So as it relates to students with disabilities, particularly in District 75, we also um, heard loudly from both, I would say, our advocate partners, our city council partners, and our um, principals and school leaders and families, the need for the possibility of in-person instruction five days a week or alternate weeks where students come every day for one week and then every day for the next week. And those are some of the additional considerations that we had in our program modeling for District 75. I wanna have uh, Risi talk a little bit about how we track that information um, uh, because also know that once we started school, uh, and, and Risi can talk more about this, principals in weighing the needs of their communities have also submitted uh, proposals as well to revise their original submissions. Risi? Yeah, thank you, Linda. My name is Risi Dunn. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer in the Office of the First Deputy Chancellor. Happy to be here. Um, I think to, the, to Linda's point, there are the number of approved models that we shared, uh, programming models that we shared during the summer and schools applied to, uh, to figure out what model they were gonna use and what was gonna best service their community. And if they didn't, um, if they couldn't meet one of the existing models, they were also, uh, there was an exceptions process as well. Um, and so that's tracked through the schools applying, the principals applying, getting approval through their superintendent for an approved model. And if there was an exception, it came here centrally. Um, since we've been open, as some uh, more students and families have gone remote, we have seen revisions to those models um, where they've also applied for a, a modification to their exception where they were trying to see more students in person or trying to prioritize more students with disabilities and that was one of the, um, the existing guidance that exists around how you uh, can uh, prioritize more students with disabilities for in-person learning. And so we have seen those come in as well. And so that's essentially something that's coming up centrally through the program modeling tracking. So Mr. Dunn, I appreciate that. Uh, do you know how many students uh, uh, who are in ICT who do not have a teacher for both blended and fully remote? I do not have that information uh, tracked through the way we do the models. The models is essentially saying what days of service somebody would, would be in and how they're running the program. Right. I mean, I just want to just note that this is a part of the challenge here. You know, we, we need to know um, these numbers because, you know, I don't want anyone to have an impression that things are okay, things are not okay, and they're not getting the services which they are required to receive. And um, they're supposed to have more than one teacher and they're supposed to be an adequate ratio. And uh, we keep hearing these very painful stories where that's just not the case and providing clarity and transparency on this would go a long way. Um, because again, this is about helping us fight for you and fight for our kids and getting the, you know, the staff and the resources to meet the needs of our kids. Um, you know, here, I just wanna make it very clear. You know, I, I plead with state lawmakers and others for more resources to our school district. So it doesn't help when the mayor of New York says things are okay with schools, they're not. And I, I just think the more information we can get about how severe uh, the, the, the staffing shortage is and, how, and, and the impacts this has on our, our children with IEPs and other student populations, I think it goes a long way to, towards helping them. Um, I, I wanna, a couple last things. Um, I shared a proposal in this FOTI back in July that I worked on with educators, uh, parents, families um, that I believe, and I still stand by, uh, provides a little bit more equity. And you know, we hear that term a lot, but I don't think I don't think that this reopening plan that we're in is really equitable for kids who need it the most and for working parents. Um, but I shared a proposal that 
elementary school children, uh, early childhood, children with IEPs, multilingual learners, that their families be given the option of five days a week in person with the option to opt out. Um, because I understand, you know, as a former teacher, I, I understand, look, ideally, we'd all be back, but that's not the world that we're in right now. And we're still in a pandemic and we have to manage density in a large city, but there are, there are children who are experiencing instructional loss that quickly shifts from temporary to generational and they will never get this time back. And so can we build a system that understands that reality, managing density, keeping folks safe, getting resources to make sure it's, you know, it's schools are safe, but to provide additional options for, for kids who need it the most, which I think would help children with special needs. I think it would help uh, working parents, many of which are educators. Some folks forget that many, many educators are also parents. Um, they have kids in the system. But what, are, what is your expert professional opinion on what I share that I think would, would provide more equity to kids who need it the most? Thank you, Chair. Um, we discussed this a little bit, but um, you know, as Risi said, our plan uh, has, has every tension of prioritizing our students with disabilities and students with disabilities have been front and center throughout this pandemic. And which is why we started in-person summer services as soon as we possibly could. And again, why we were the only city who who provided that, that service. Um, with regard to the current uh, school opening plans, you know, schools were asked to work in within in incredibly difficult um, parameters to determine how many students they can physically accommodate in accordance with health and safety um, guidelines. And this is something that is new, right? This is a new way of programming for our schools. And there is a learning curve associated with that and rightfully so. And I think our principals have done an incredible job of uh, doing all that they can for their students and their uh, families uh, working under uh, variables that are always changing. And that's the nature of this pandemic. Um, we are currently uh, assessing, you know, our school's capacity to take on or, or um, welcome more students into the school building and, and particularly our students with disabilities. Um, as you know, our families have an, uh, the, the period to opt in is coming up again. Um, and for families that want additional uh, time in school, that is certainly a conversation that they should be having with their principals. Um, and I know that principals are making every effort that they can to accommodate uh, students and meet their needs. Um, and so this is an ongoing uh, conversation. We certainly respect um, your efforts to uh, ensure that our students with disabilities and our youngest learners have what they need. We share that, that shared goal um, and are really, uh, I, you know, more, I, I would say more to come on the programming front. And, um, and I really want to thank our principals for all they've done to accommodate as many students as they can. So I also thank our principals and our school leadership and school staff because every time City Hall issues a tweet at night, they're the ones who have to do, every, do all the work. Um, but I just wanna share with you that, you know, this, I know this is anecdotal, but I do speak, as many of you know, I speak with principals pretty much on a daily basis these days. Um, and, you know, I, I've spoken to some uh, high school leaders where, you know, they have a total enrollment of over 3,500 students, large school, but only about 200 kids are showing up in person. So the school is, it, there's, there's, there, there are not many kids. And I wanna be very clear on why I'm being told that's the case. So basically it's, it's attendance of like almost 6% of, of kids showing up. Uh, the reason why I, this is happening from what I'm being told is because of the severe staffing shortages that really, I mean, they impact system-wide, but it has a real impact on high school, middle schools because 
you have to have, as you know, licensed subject teachers to teach specific courses. You can't just put a, a random person to teach a, a chemistry class. You need a licensed science teacher to do that. So in many cases in the high school world, you have what I call virtual study hall, where four or five kids are in a room logging, logging on to Zoom, connecting with their teacher from home, while an adult just watches them, supervises them. Um, I asked the chancellor at last week's hearing the percentage of schools that are doing this because of the staffing shortage. We didn't hear, we didn't hear back yet, but I'm hearing it. I'm hearing it citywide. Uh, when I mentioned this at a school in Brooklyn yesterday, I was contacted by a school in the Bronx that has a, a school about 500 kids total, only about 30 kids showing up. So I, I look at this as an as as really an indication that the, 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 this hybrid plan is really not working. Um, and it's, you have this space that can be better utilized for programming to better meet the needs of kids who really need it the most. And I would, would really, you know, like we still don't even have attendance data. And does anyone have that with them today? Since, you know, we had to subpoena it back in the spring do we have attendance data for schools now? Does anyone have that with them? So Chair, we do have the attendance data as, as you have as well from the spring. And I know that last week um, uh, my colleagues also did uh, say that would be information that would be provided. Um, but in terms of the spring data of about 200,000 students with IEPs who were enrolled last year, we know that about 649 of them did not log in in the spring. And so um, this is not including the about, there's about 494 students who are also in the Pathways to Graduation program. So we try very closely to track that and make sure that we can support our schools based on the information that we get. Um, so I, I can share obviously the spring data with you and our colleagues are working on making sure you and council members get current uh, attendance information. We, just to note, Dr. Chen, I, I know that the DOE had the information from the spring. They had it in the spring, but folks at City Hall, for whatever reason, did not want to share it with us until we had to issue a subpoena. Um, we need the current attendance information. And again, to make it clear, this is not a, a game. This is not a political tit for tat. This is about making sure that we um, make the necessary decisions and moves to better meet the needs of our kids. Because from what I'm piecing together, and I'm just, just to note, I am speaking with schools across the city getting their attendance information. And I'm, I'm compiling my own information uh, and it is painful. It is painful. And I think that we are losing each day, losing opportunities to really rethink this approach um, and to immediately put in place you know, a system that provides more in-person services and options for, for kids who need it the most um, that I think would, would go um, now, I, I wanna just ask before I turn over to my co-chair now, um, the percentage of parents who have given consent for uh, remote related um, services, do, do you have that? I believe Christina is just double checking to see if we have the precise numbers. Yes, I was just waiting to unmute. I actually would want to invite uh, my colleague, John Hammer, to answer this question. Chair Schrager, thank you for this, uh, this important question and for the opportunity to, uh, to testify here today. Um, our related service providers are continuing uh, outreach to families to initiate uh, both teletherapy and in-person related services. Uh, to date, uh, we have contacted, related service providers have contacted families um, a little under 190,000 uh, instances across speech, OT, PT, and counseling, and are working with those families to uh, initiate service uh, as outreach is conducted. Do you, have, do you have the percentage of the parents who have given consent for the services? 
the, the, the consent information, we can absolutely follow up and, and that is information that uh, we are collecting and we can provide uh, after the hearing. Okay, because that's, that's really important. And, and John, I believe you were at the hearing last week when, um, I just want to note that I know this is not about the health committee, this is now with Chair Ayala, but I just want to note that there were, there were gaps in communicating with certain school communities about the entire uh, testing plan, particularly District 75, that has caused a lot of, I am still hearing to this day, a lot of confusion on the ground about what the testing plan strategy is. So I just want to double down on making sure that DOE communicates as clearly as possible with school communities and families about what the what the plan actually is and what it's not because I am flooded with emails from folks who just do not have uh, clear clear information uh, about that. Um, I'm mindful of time. I want to turn over now to my uh, co-chair, very patient co-chair and great colleague who's worked so hard on this issue, uh, council member Diana Allen. Thank you, Chair Traeger. Um, I wanted to acknowledge, and I wrote it somewhere, that we've also been joined by council members Drum, Van Bramer, Ulrich, Lander, and Carnegie. Um, so I have a lot of questions, and I'm a little disappointed that you know we, we don't have some of the numbers that we're requesting because I believe that the questions were submitted to the administration uh, far enough in advance that these numbers should be uh, made available, specifically relating to staffing. Um, but my first question is, 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 re is actually related to the staffing needs of District 75 students. Um, because I'm gonna rewind this to the moment that we're getting kids on a bus to actually physically get them to the school. So our understanding is that there is a significant shortage of paraprofessionals and nurses. Uh, to accompany District 75 students on yellow uh, school buses. Is that true? And how significant is this, uh, this shortage? And what is the DOE doing to address this? So we have continually been working on staffing, uh, as you know, and that includes with busing. I want to make sure that um, Sean Fitzpatrick uh, from Office of People Transportation can speak more to that as well as Lauren Siciliano, but similar to what we've shared about uh, teaching staff, that is also a priority for us to ensure that this is done with busing. Sean? Yes, hi, uh, good morning. Uh, so we, we have within OPT, um, we have a, uh, a person who is dedicated to um, special populations um, and that, that team uh, works directly with the Division of Specialized Instruction and Student Support uh, so that they are kept up to date on uh, what students are taking buses, which buses they are taking, the routes that they are on, uh, to make sure that um, they understand what the staffing needs are. And then the Division of Specialized Instruction and Student Support uh, then looks to make sure that we have the necessary um, paraprofessionals on hand uh, to address that. So um, it long, long, Long story short, um, you know, we, we recognize that uh, the paraprofessional um, uh, title is, is certainly critical. Uh, we are working every day with that division and directly with schools to make sure that we have the appropriate personnel on hand to address that. How significant is the shortage? Uh, I, I would have to defer to um, Christina to to because that's that title comes out of that particular group. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was just waiting to unmute. Uh, I, I just want to make something clear. Um, that while there's no system-wide shortage of paraprofessionals, there have been some challenges in encouraging. Uh, school-based paraprofessionals uh, to accept some of these positions. This, these busing paraprofessional 
uh, positions are done via a posting process at the school level. However, what we have asked schools to do is that when they are unable to identify a transportation paraprofessional, they work with their borough offices um, to identify a paraprofessional either um, from a school, another school that is close in the district or through a contracted agency. Um, and so any family that does not have a paraprofessional transport, uh, a, a, a transportation paraprofessional, paraprofessional in place um, can reach out uh, to their school, but also to our special education inbox at specialeducationatschools.nyc.gov or 311. And we'll be happy to make sure that that service gets um, started. In response directly to your, your question, Chair, we will um, get back to you with the exact number of, of students still waiting on their transportation paraprofessionals. And in regard to your, uh, um, I know that there's also been questions around nursing and uh, students who, re who require uh, nursing support for transportation, uh, for nursing support. Um, I defer to my colleague, uh, Katie, from the Division of School Climate and Wellness uh, to respond to that question. Hi, yes, yes, we do have sufficient nurses uh, for uh, the, the students with IEPs who require one on the bus. So we have nurses, but we don't have sufficient power professionals, but we don't know what the number of students that are not receive that are received that are not receiving transportation services is at this point. I think that's for Christina. Chair, we're gonna, we, we, just, we do know we do not have that number with us today, but we can commit to getting you that number um, uh, after the hearing. I appreciate that, but I, I mean, I, I would hope that the DOE would anticipate that this would be one of our questions. I mean, it's, it's the simplest question I have on my list of questions today. Um, and, you know, it, it's, we haven't even gotten to, to the school building yet, right? We're talking about transporting the neediest of children to the actual building. Mm -hmm. You know, most parents don't have access to a vehicle. Traveling via public transportation is a nightmare. And when you're also working remotely and trying to make a living to pay for, you know, for food and for rent, it's nearly impossible. So we need to know how many children are actually making it to the school building who opted to go into school um, because maybe their disability is so uh, so serious in nature that that remote learning is just not an option for them. So, you know, I mean, when we talk about the inequities, I mean, it's like, it's, it's just, and I, and I really appreciate that we're in the middle of a pandemic and that there's no, there was no protocol for this, that we were, you know, not prepared. And I, you know, I don't even blame anybody at this point because who, who would have anticipated that we would be living, you know, the, the situation that we're living in. But Having said that, we shut schools down in March. We're now in October. Um, we had more than sufficient time to plan accordingly to ensure that we were starting from a place where the neediest uh, children were prioritized and that we understood that the complexities of servicing children with disabilities that require a different method of teaching, mm -hmm. um, require more hands-on approach, a lot, a lot more of in-person ser in -person services, um, that we would be a little bit more comfortable um, with the DOE's approach to teaching these children in October, right? Um, and I don't, and I, I you know, I, I echo uh, Chair Traeger's uh, remarks that that's, that's not the information um, or the feeling, the sentiment that we're getting from parents of children in District 75 schools. So there is a huge disconnect here. So now we're getting on the bus, we get into the school building. Mm -hmm. What is the process for testing children um, for COVID? Um, I got an email from a parent the other day whose daughter is has severe autism and she is required to be tested, right? To get into, if she wants to do uh, in-person, she has to be tested. And um, because of her disability, remote learning is just not an option for her. And so the testing process is very, you know, is, is, is very uh, traumatizing for a child um, on the spectrum. She's, you know, she says that this is the worst thing that she has ever had to subject her child to. Mm. How is the DOE addressing this? Is testing 
um, mandated? Is it being done in the school? Are parents permitted to be allowed to be uh, in, in the room when their child is being tested? Yeah, I appreciate that question. Um, and we, we too have heard similar concerns from uh, our families and understand the need for additional flexibility on this front. We're finalizing, we're working with our sister agencies to finalize um, testing guidance for our District 75 students. But I also invite us to unmute my colleague, um, Katie uh, from the Division of School Climate and Wellness uh, to talk a little bit more comprehensively about the, the testing procedures overall. Thank you, Christina. Yeah, we know that many families, uh, you know, are not comfortable yet with the testing. They feel like they need more time and information uh, before they're going to feel comfortable. And we're really trying to, to give them that space and that uh, uh, information uh, and be able to work through that, especially for District 75 students. Uh, in terms of what we're allowed to do in, uh, for the testing, um, I, you know, I really, I think some, most of you were at the hearing last week when we were joined by our health partners who talked about uh, what they need in order to have the random testing be successful. Uh, and, you know, we did talk with them and advocate about things like allowing parents to be in the room, um, but ultimately we do defer to their health uh, guidance about what makes the most sense. And at this point, they don't believe that that's a path that makes sense uh, going forward. Um, so we do continue to work with them and follow, defer to them on issues of health and safety for that. So can, can a student right now, I'm assuming the answer is no, but can a student for whom testing is difficult, um, can they can they go to their their own private medical provider that has already an established you know uh, relationship with this child? That's a, another thing that we did raise with our health partners when developing this plan. Uh, unfortunately, they ultimately determined that for the random testing to work and for them to have the data that they need, that's not something that they could allow. Well, I'm sorry, who are your health partners? Uh, the uh, Health and Hospitals in the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. So they determined that it was not in the school's best interest to have a parent in the room when a child with a severe disability who may be further traumatized be tested for COVID? So the, the determination they make there is that, as you know, we're trying to minimize the number of people and the number of, uh, you know, the crowding in a school, right? And they determine that having extra people in the room um, is not something that makes sense with health and safety protocols. I know many of you were on the hearing last week where they talked about more in depth the different decisions they made around that. But this is, I, I would imagine that this would be a, a special exception because these are children with unique challenges. And um, I mean, the, the description um, that I received from this parent, I mean, it took five people to hold this child down to test her. Yeah, uh, I you imagine uh, five people that you do not know that you haven't seen in months holding you down to test you and your parent not being there. That's hard. Yeah, I, I agree. And that's one of the reasons why we're working on the uh, special plan for D75. I'll turn it back to Christina. Thank you, Katie. Chair, we understand what you're saying, the, and this is not. This is a very real concern that that we do take seriously. We are, as Katie just said, working on a special plan for our students with with more um, profound disabilities and significant needs to ensure that the testing process is not going to be one that uh, is is overly intrusive or invasive for them. Uh, we understand that we need to work with our families to determine um, how we can test students in a way that is um, supportive. And we also understand that there are some students who are gonna struggle with the testing process and, and maybe that is not an appropriate thing to do at school. Um, and so if that is the case, then we will we will work, we are working out um, accommodations and we'll we'll have a comprehensive plan for testing of our district 75 students shortly how yeah. soon do you, how soon how, i mean when you say shortly how soon do, how soon is shortly yeah um my understanding is that we uh it, it will um it will testing for our district 75 students first of all has not started yet we were aiming to to start in november T st testing for our district 75 staff has 
has um, started. Uh, but I imminently, I think in the next you know, week or so, we should have uh, a plan that takes into account the parent feedback that we've received and feedback exactly what you're like, you're, what are you just saying, what you're just saying around um, how to provide uh, a testing environment um, and, and who, who do we test and how do we support all of our students uh, in that process? Um, because that is a very valid and real concern. Does, does, the, does the DOE, and I don't know this, does the DOE have um, an office um, for uh, students with disabilities that helps to kind of to advise um, that is communicating with health and hospitals and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to come up with the best strategy? Because I mean, um, I, I, I think that all voices need to be at the table, right? And that we need to have a plan A, B, C, and D as it yes. relates to, you know, children with um, disabilities because you know they're all different types of disabilities and not all children react in the same way, right? Uh, right. So who who is acting you know on in in the best interest of these children on you know in the DOE? Yeah, that's right. You're absolutely right. We need to have multiple options and uh, and we need to to be able to make sure that we're we're scaffolding supports for our students. There is a health and safety point within District 75 that has been working with. Um, health and, and hospitals, but also uh, with all of us here uh, to ensure that the, the needs of our District 75 students are represented. We've also engaged many of our parent partners, uh, CCD 75 and CCSE and, and others to gain feedback um, on firsthand from families as, as to what is going to work for their students and what isn't and what their preferences are. And that's all uh, very much informing this process. And we thank um, our, our partner advocates uh, in both entities for their help in informing this is in terms of uh, developing policies that are really gonna work for our students and families. Now for children whose disabilities are so severe that they really just don't make a good candidate for virtual learning. Is there some sort of orientation with the parent? Is there an opportunity to uh, have a, a, a thorough discussion with the parent to advise in person as opposed to virtual because of the nature of the child's um, you know, disability or learning difference that would better be met by in-person in -person instruction? Yes, um, so the, the Back in March, when we transitioned to, to remote learning chair, one of the first thing that we immediately did was ask that a remote learning plan be created for every one of our students with IEPs. And the reason we did this was because we knew exactly what you were saying is, is going to be true. Parents need to be part of the process of determining what is going to be and the, less, the best learning environment and how we can best support our students as they take on this very new world. Um, now, when we weren't able to offer blended learning like we're doing now, it was only remote. You know, the remote learning plan was intended to outline the services and supports that were going to help uh, the child in a remote setting. And so the IP is developed for the school setting. The home setting is now the learning environment, you know, as was the case back in the spring. And we have to connect with you all as, as parents and partners to determine what is going to be best for that child. And if they are re working remotely and can't attend to a, a screen, which is true for many of our children, then what are we going to be doing to support them? And so we asked our schools to come up with alternatives and many of them have come up with incredible alternatives, whether that be paper packets and resources in the family's home language, or whether that be more movement-based activities that we lead our families in guiding our children through at home. Um, these are all strategies that we've used, but quite frankly, Chair, it's why we tried so hard to and did successfully provide those in-person related services over the summer, um, because we knew that we weren't uh, going to be able to reach every child particularly every child with a disability during remote learning. And by reach, I don't mean contact, I mean make sure that we're meeting their needs and their learning styles uh, remotely because the remote instruction was, was, was going to be difficult. We also um, made sure that our related service providers did the same. So they were reaching out to the family and saying, look, you know, we know that your child's a kindergartner and they have speech on their IEP for three sessions a week. 
are you able to support them during this time? And what do you think is gonna be work best for you in the home? And our guidance has been to our, to our incredible related service providers that they have a conversation about, with the family about how to best implement that service during remote learning. And for some families, they said, I'm gonna start with one session and we're gonna build up to three sessions, but can we start with one? And here's the best time that I'm available to do that. I'm available, to, I, can, I can support my child at this time, you know, uh, based on my, my schedule and could we accommodate that? And what we have asked our providers to do is to accommodate each one of those requests. Um, and that is true in the remote uh, learning environment and in the blended learning environment. Um, now in the current environment, um, where blended learning is reality, we've in, doubled down on those efforts to make sure that we are clearly documenting what approaches, strategies, supports, including behavior supports, are working for students as they transition um, in and out of the school build, physical school building and onto remote learning. Um, and, and that is something that is documented and memorialized in, in uh, the program adaptations documents and, and the related service documents to make sure that we are in fact capturing the things that are working for the family and working for the student and are not working. And, and where progress is being made, that should be documented as well. And where progress is not being made and, and learning has been interrupted, that is also something that we capture and we're, we're going to need to address through IEP meetings and ongoing conversations with um, our teachers. What, can, can I ask, what is the, is, is there an impediment in allowing a little bit more flexibility for the opt-in option? Uh, doing either hybrid or, you know, um, straight, you know, in-person. For instance, I have a constituent whose son has cerebral palsy. He mm -hmm. is struggling heavily at home. The, the mother uh, did not have access to a working computer. I don't know, for some reason there was some confusion, was not able to opt into in-person or hybrid during whatever um, specified time was allowed. And so the school automatically enrolled him for virtual. Um, so now they have, the family has to wait until November, I believe it is, for the, the opportunity to then switch over to in-person or hybrid. And in the interim, this child is learning absolutely nothing. And for a person, for a child with a disability like his, um, this type of delay could be really detrimental because it can really, you know, it, it's not a minor setback. These children, I mean, therapists and professionals work with these children quite intensively. Yes. Um, and so any type of disruption to the routine can really set them back years. So she's really worried that, you know, um, this is not something that's going to, you know, the, that the DOE is going to be able to remedy um, and that this is going to have long-term implications for her child. Um, and I agree. I agree. So, so, you know, is there flexibility for children, um, like him who maybe, you know, the parent maybe thought that they could handle, you know, virtual or for some reason, um, there was some sort of disconnect and they weren't able to opt in and are now, you know, realizing that, um, that it's necessary. Why, you know, subject them to having to wait so long. Yeah. Can we un unmute Dr. Chen? She's she's uh, wanting to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Chair, um, thank you for the question, and I think we we want to. What you are bringing up is incredibly important around being able to be flexible to meet the differing needs of our students and our families. So I wanted to underscore a couple of things about what the process has been and what we're working on moving forward. Um, so number one, the in-person was the default mode, if you will. So unless a parent or a guardian specifically um, opted into fully remote, uh, they would be in person. And I hear, I think what you're saying is also that there has been some confusion and perhaps some of those families may have done that in error. I know that um, principals have been working very closely with families. And in those cases where there was some confusion or some uh, misunderstanding, they have been rectifying those. So I wanted to be clear about that on the record. And moving forward, as you mentioned, we do have another um, opt-in uh, a moment, if you will, because we said to families, if you're going to opt into fully remote, you have until 
um, it was around Thanksgiving that time, right? And so what we have been doing now that we have been in person and a lot of these issues that you're bringing up has become more to the surface now, what we've been doing is also working to make sure that as we go into this next cycle or shift, if you will, um, that we are making sure that we can double down on ensuring that we now have better insight into what the particular needs are, that we can work with um, student for, with our schools to provide families with that clarity around what it means to be in person, how many days, and what are those kinds of variables and flexibilities, and then also what it is um, in fully remote. But we also want to make sure, I know we're talking generally and broadly here, we also want to make sure if you don't mind providing us offline with the information on the constituents so we can be sure to follow up and meet their needs and, and make sure that that's clear. Is the DOE, just out of curiosity, so when I, when I used to work in senior services, there was a mandate on all city agencies to come up with a contingency plan for cases of, of, of emergency. So whether it be, you know, uh, weather related or, you know, we're in the midst of a storm. Does the DOE have a plan in action, like a written plan in place for emergencies that would prevent the schools from being open and what that, and how, how do children with uh, learning uh, disabilities or, uh, you know, special needs fit into that? contingency plan like what is that emergency plan look does, is does it exist and what does it look like or is it being created in, in a in a post you know uh covid world so what i'm hearing are are uh, two possible aspects of this so there is a health and safety contingency plan and we have a situation room and when that happens we are constantly in communication with school families, uh, school communities to make sure, you know, if you would go into a quarantine of a classroom or the entire school and what it would be for remote. And related to that, I think is maybe probably what you're asking as well. And please correct me if I'm misinterpreting here, is also what's the learning contingency plan, if you will. And so part of what we've done, and if you recall, in the opening days of school, it was all ensuring that all of our, our students across the city were able to log in and to be able to have access to technology and to be able to have those remote uh, accommodations, if you will, set up for every student, because that is part of the default plan, right? So if for health and safety measures, we must suspend in-person learning in a particular classroom in our school, then it defaults into remote learning. And part of that work was to make sure that, and, and again, I wanna say as, uh, as both chairs you have, have, have commented, we are trying to get better and better at this. I, I will not say that we figured everything out. I think uh, we are trying to get better and better at this. So part of the idea was that there would be that contingency where if we went remote, then students would know where to go to get their information, uh, assignments, communication from their teacher and from their school. Um, and so those are the instructional, if you will, aspects of the contingency plan. So all of those things are in their Google Classroom. So most of the majority of the city schools, um, over 95% are working in Google Classroom. So we wanna make sure that our families and our students, and that's what the opening days was for, to make sure that everyone knew where to access that information. There would be schedules for logging in and those kinds of things. So on that front, there's the instructional aspect of it. But I also wanna make sure that Katie, um, Jay can also speak to some of the emergency response contingencies because we also have those um, organized as well. Katie, do you want to add to that? Uh, so to be clear, every school building has uh, a safety plan that includes uh, emergency procedures for closure under a variety of circumstances. Um, we also, as a as a department and as a school system, do have emergency plans in place for bigger things. For example. Schools were closed for a whole week during Hurricane Sandy, as I'm sure many of you remember. And uh, during H1N1, we did do school-based shutdowns uh, similar to what we're dealing with now. Of course, in, under this much bigger circumstance, we do have a much broader plan in place for school closures. Uh, under referenced, uh, you know, the situation room and the protocols we have in place there for when there are 
cases in schools under different circumstances. Uh, so yes, all schools have those plans and we do have both a broader general DOE plan that we use. Uh, and then of course, right now one's adapted to this particular circumstance. And as she also referenced, that includes a plan for kids to be doing remote learning when that happens. Did that plan anticipate the need for adaptive devices and iPads and you know all of the good stuff that kids need now that we're ordering and you know seems to continuously be on backlog because I, I'm concerned that you know I mean even even though um, you know I, I will acknowledge that a significant number of, of iPads um, have been distributed uh, throughout the city I will, I'll share with you that my son I have a, I still have one in school who's uh, just turned 15 he's in his second year of high school and I got a call from the uh, UPS guy one day and he said hey I have your iPad. I'm like two blocks away from your home. Can you come and like find me so that I can give it to you? And I'm like, what do you mean? You have my iPad two blocks away and I have to come and find you. He said, well, the DOE never put your apartment number on, you know, the address. And so I was at your building, but I couldn't find you. And so I, you know, I'm driving around the neighborhood, dropping off some other stuff. And I figured, you know, I, before I take it back with me, if it's, if it's okay, maybe you might want to um, come, come find me and you know, and I'll, and I'll hand it to you. And so I had to send somebody downstairs to run and get the iPad so that he had access to it. Um, but had he not had the iPad, you know, I'm sure he could use his phone. I, I would find him something else. You know, we have the ability to do that at home. But what happens with a child who um, needs some sort of adaptive device that maybe not, maybe nonverbal, maybe has a visual impairment? Um, there are specific devices that are used within the school building that parents don't have access to at home, right? Because they normally wouldn't need to have that at home. But these are expensive types of equipment that most of our parents cannot afford to purchase. So, um, so how, how are we dealing with those children? Um, independent of the iPads, um, are these type of devices uh, being afforded to those parents? Yes, you're absolutely right that there are adaptive technology devices that students with disabilities need, and that is also part of their service plan that is in their IEP, and and that would be delineated there. And we have, you know, since you know even March, uh, we've been making sure to follow up that students have those devices. Um, what you're describing, and, and I know that Lauren is taking notes here around delivery, We're, we'll take note of that to, to make sure because you, you're right, it shouldn't be someone calling and meeting somewhere to get the device. Uh, but I also want to flag that I, I'm glad to hear that there was some security measures also, and, and rather than just leaving it on a doorstep, if you will. Um, so I don't know if Christina wants to add more in terms of the adaptive technology, but you're absolutely right. And we really make sure that those students have not just an iPad device, but other devices that they need, may need as well. No, thank you, Linda. I don't have anything further to add. So do the kids have the, 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 the devices or not? I mean, what, was there a need for the DOE to purchase additional uh, devices, te technological devices for children with disabilities for in uh, virtual um, homeschooling? So in, at, for students with disabilities, as with all students, we did um, provide um, additional iPads. So you'll remember in the spring was 300,000 and then we have now recently added 100,000. And certainly in the spring, there were about 100,000 for students specifically with disabilities. So in terms of that, um, we are making sure, and again, I think Lauren Siciliano mentioned this before, but we also, in terms of the needs that we know about, we also prioritize the order in which students receive this. And so students with disabilities, students in temporary housing have priorities. Um, as you may be aware, there's a global a supply chain problem right now with devices. And so that means even though we've allocated funding and orders on 100,000, that doesn't mean that we currently have them available to hand out right now. And so as they come in, we are prioritizing particularly for uh, the students that I've mentioned. Um, and I think you also asked specifically about adaptive technology, which may not be just a regular iPad, for instance. Yeah. Those are part of what we always do for IEPs and we are 
continuing to follow up on this. And when we know that there are needs, we are fulfilling them. So I would strongly encourage, um, Christina mentioned before, that families can email our inbox around special education. If there's someone who does not have uh, a device or adaptive technology advice, we want to know about it. Um, but, but we want, we want we to know about it this. too. Yes, we, I mean, we, we do track this. We, we right. want to know how many children, I mean, because when I mean adaptive device, I mean, you have children that are, you know, they read Braille. Um, you have children that, you know, use this, I, I forget the name of it, but it's like this uh, device that, they attach to the wheelchair that they can yes. use to communicate. And oftentimes that equipment is shared, you know, in the classroom setting amongst the children, right? There aren't enough for every child or whatever. So if the child's parent chose, or maybe, you know, not even chose, right? There was some, at some point it wasn't even optional to do virtual instruction. Was that child provided as per their IEP, the equipment necessary to give them the education that they needed as per that IEP. So how many, I, I would love to know what that number is. Okay, I think Christina is asking to be yeah. unmuted um, to, to give you a little bit more detail. I understand, thank you so much for the clarification. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. We could, we could certainly, um, Supply you with the number of, of students that have AT value that have AT um, devices, and I'm going to ask my team to tee up that number while I begin the question, and then I will turn it over to John Hammer to to finish it. But um, you're absolutely right that so many of our students with disabilities benefit from their assistive technology, um, and it and it was the utmost importance that our not only that our students received the technology that. Uh, is outlined on their IEP um, to ensure that they have access to uh, curriculum and to communication devices, um, but also so that they received ongoing support with those devices throughout remote learning. And so because assistive technology is um, key to so many of our students, um, assistive technology is one of the things that we would account for in the uh, remote learning plan and in the program adaptations um, document um, and is, is a part of the overall landscape of, of services being provided to the students. And to my team uh, that is on the line, I, I invite us to unmute John Hammer. Uh, and John, if you have those numbers, could you provide them? And if not, can you, uh, can we please follow up with the council right after the hearing? Absolutely. Um... Looks like citywide there are uh, 12, a little over 12,500 uh, students with assistive technology recommendations across charter uh, community school districts and non-public school settings. Thank you, John. What were the recommendation, but how many are receiving those services? So when we went to remote learning, the recommendation was that to all schools was that children be sent home with those devices. So the service that they were receiving in the school building, the device that was supporting them in the school building, we asked all principals to send that home with the child so that that support would continue during remote learning. If, if any escalations came into our central inbox where that was not done, uh, we were able to either provide devices through uh, centrally but, um, or through the district, district 75 office. Um, but our guidance to schools was to send home any mandated assistive, assistive technology chair to the to with the students. So of those, are, students, you, are you comfortable then saying, you know, are, are you comfortable uh, enough to say today that you believe that every child who um, should have gone home with some sort of device went home with that device? I am comfortable to say that that is what we asked of. I am confident and sure that we asked every school to do that. If that did not happen for an individual student, we would certainly want to know that. And that is something that we would ask the family to reach out to their school to flag that. And if a school has any difficulty fulfilling that need, uh, this is where we would come in and make sure that that, that assistive technology is provided centrally uh, Per the IEP mandate because that is our responsibility to do so. Now, I mean, I, I would assume that there's an assumption that parents automatically know to do this. They may not. They may not. No. They may be home right now, sitting without a device, and not know 
that they have the option to call the school. Um, so I don't, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable with um, putting the responsibility onto the parent or to the, 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 the guardian to feel, you know, to, to, to make the request. I, I, is yeah. there somebody that's calling and saying, listen, as per the IEP, your child should have gone home with X, Y, and Z. Is that the case? Is the device working? Is it operational? And check that off so that we know that if we had 300 children in the database that needed devices, we know that 298 of them received it and that we still have two more that we have to um, supply equipment to. Yes. Is that happening? Yes, Chair, that is that is part of, of why we were asking for the remote learning plans and for the program adaptations document and for the related service document to be completed. To be completed. I, I, I think um, I just wanna emphasize and make clear that an integral point, component of that, of those plans is that the school reaches out to the family. So to your point, that that communication is not on the family, that, that, that communication is on the school. And we are asking them to reach out and make sure that the student has um, all of the IEP mandated um, uh, services, but also devices, um, and that that remains um, the continuity of the provision of that service remains throughout. In terms of escalating any concerns, um, I just you know I, I always like to point out that we you know fully staff our special education inbox so that we have a little bit of a safety net for families who uh, and many 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 families take us up on that offer to help resolve uh, school level concerns regarding special education provision. Um, and, and this, in fact, is the inbox that Chair Trigger was, was citing earlier in terms of communication uh, to families and support to families. We, we let families know that we uh, will get back to them within 20 to 4 to 48 hours at minimum to acknowledge their concern. Um, and then we follow up uh, to make sure until that, that escalation is resolved. So if a family, for example, were to reach out to that inbox, uh, we would track that, that concern until the device actually reached the home of, of the family. Um, and that is, and we do not close out any of our escalations until they're fully resolved. Um, and so uh, didn't mean to imply that this was on the onus of the parent. It certainly isn't. I just want to uh, use the opportunity to um, reinforce the availability of that option for all of your constituents um, and every family that we serve throughout the city. No, I, I appreciate that. And I'm gonna ask one more question because I know that we have um, some colleagues that have been patiently waiting um, and I, I've been on the other end of the waiting spectrum and I know it's pretty grueling. Um, but uh, the, so in, in regards to the uh, specialized services, so children that are receiving physical um, uh, occupational therapy, speech language therapies, how are we doing that remotely? Um, because I, I know that in, in sometimes, uh, in some cases, there's a, you know, you require the use of certain, you know, um, equipment and tools. It's very personal. Um, how is that? How are you guys pulling that off? Yes, that's, um, I, I hate to be a broken record with this, but again, this is, this is why we've spent the time uh, documenting exactly that. Um, the, the related service plans that I mentioned earlier are intended to um, talk about how those services will be provided in a remote or blended environment because exactly to your point, um, they're very much individualized and uh, our related service providers are incredibly, incredibly, incredibly skilled professionals um, who uh, know what, how to clinically and um, make things work for our students. And that's a conversation that we really now more than ever need to have with our parents on an ongoing basis of how are we gonna make these skills that are effective in person uh, work in, in a blended environment and what do we need to do differently? What do we need to do more of? This is exactly the intention of, um, of why we place such a strong emphasis on our program adaptations document and, and our related service documentation during this time. Okay. I kind of lied a little bit, sorry colleagues, but just one, one last question, seriously. Um, so given, given the small size of self-contained special education classes, can the DOE prioritize offering full-time and person instruction to students in special education classes during the next quarter for parents who may want that option? Can you unmute Dr. Chen, please?
Thank you so much. Um, we have been looking at those options and um, a couple of things I just want to also flag Sa health and safety come first and foremost. And in some of our self-contained classrooms, they are also in smaller classrooms. So I just wanted to make sure that that was also part of the variable that's being considered here. Um, but I know that a number of schools have been thinking about that specifically. And that's also why in the approved program models that Reese mentioned earlier for District 75 schools, uh, a number of them with self-contained classrooms, uh, that was an option as well to have all the students uh, come in person. So we definitely support the ability to bring as many students in person as possible, including thinking about the self-contained classroom sizes and the ratios, as long as we can meet our health and safety um, parameters. And we'll continue to do that. So uh, thank you for encouraging uh, us to push us to think more towards that to ensure that our students with disabilities get the maximum in-person supports. I, I appreciate that. And I want to thank you. And I want to just um, raise one point that I think that special attention should be given. Also, we have a lot of new learners, new students that are coming into the school system for the very first time this year who may, you know, have learning disabilities that are in, in blended school environments, um, in a classroom, in a very different uh, type of model, um, you know, that we're not yet comfortable with. We're still learning. And I, I you know, I, I'm concerned that those children's, um, you know, differences won't necessarily be identified early enough be, simply because of the complexity of, you know, that comes with, with the virtual um, learning model. Uh, I have a niece that um, was actually in class the other day and was struggling because she could not read. She's in the first grade and she could not read. And her father's a single dad. Um, he's working, you know, all day. So now she's in the care of you know, uh, another family who's also teaching four other small children um, at the same time, and it becomes very difficult. So I don't think that she has a learning disability, but I realize how, you know, how easily they can kind of fall back. And um, the teacher was just trying to help her, but at some point she kind of had to let it go and move on with the, with the class, right? And so that type of indiv individualized attention um, it's kind of lost in all of this. And I think that that can be seriously detrimental, especially to children, um, you know, that live in communities like mine who are already facing so many, you know, uh, challenges to begin with, whether they suffer from a disability or not. Um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to live in a COVID world for all of us. But when your parents are on the threat of eviction or job loss or, you know, really trying to keep that job, but also, you know, really concerned about making sure that their children have a good uh, education. Um, that weighs really heavily on my mind. And so that was the premise for this hearing today. And I thank you for coming um, to testify. I'm sure that my colleagues have wonderful questions um, to follow up with. And I, you know, if I, if I think of anything, I'll come back around. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chairs Traeger and Ayala. Um, I will now turn to um, committee members for questions. I just want to remind committee members that we are limiting council member questions to five minutes. Um, this includes both questions and answers, uh, and we will not be allowing a second round of questioning. Please use the raise hand uh, Zoom function, and I will call you in the order with which you raised your hand. Um, and just to be clear, so no one thinks there's cutting in line, Councilmember Barron was after Councilmember uh, Gradenchik, but dropped off, but she's back. So the order of questions will be Councilmember Gradenchik, Councilmember Barron, Councilmember Lewis, and Councilmember Borelli. We will start with Councilmember Gradenchik. Your time starts now. Thank you. I, I, I hope I remember my question. It's been a while. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairs Traeger and Ayala. Uh, thank you to the representatives of the Department of Education. Um, the needs of children with disabilities has been a profound concern to me, uh, especially since I joined the council. Um, I have, uh, depending on how you count, at least five standalone District 75 schools in my district. Um, and one of the things that has always concerned me um, is the great distance that uh, many of these children have to travel, uh, including one that travels, believe it or not, 
uh, from Staten Island um, to Eastern Queens, uh, or had been every day. I don't know the status of that individual student. Um, I'm wondering uh, how that is working. And I'm really picking up on some of what Chair Ayala said um, during uh, this epidemic, this pandemic, and how we're doing with that uh, in terms of uh, the children's transportation needs, because um, that's a big part of the battle for, you know, and I, I have one child that uh, there was an ambulance outside uh, P811 one morning on Marathon Parkway. And um, the principal explained to me that that child comes and goes every day by ambulance. So um, our dedication to our, our, our young people with special needs is great. Um, however, um, I am concerned about the transportation. I hope you could talk about that. The, the transportation of students and making sure they get to uh, the in-person learning is incredibly important as you've expressed. And um, we always, I think first and foremost, try to make sure that students have options as close to home as possible and we work with, with our families to do that. But then we also wanna make sure that there is transportation occurring and I am, very happy to say that our Office of People Transportation worked very quickly to be able to, um, and, and I know personally, I also intervened in some uh, supports with busing companies as well, and everyone has been very cooperative to make sure that uh, the students get to and from the locations on the days that they are in person. So I would invite Sean Fitzpatrick to say any more specifically about transportation to make sure you have those finer details. Got on mute, Sean. Oh, thank you. Good. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, our our responsibility, as you know, is to get students to and from school in a safe and timely manner. Um, and once the school program uh, is in place, um, we work to route the students as efficiently and as directly as as possible. Even when there's no specific requirements mandated by an IEP. Um, we generally, we follow the, the following guidelines. If, if it's in borough, uh, we try to make sure that that travel time is no longer than 90 minutes. Out of borough, no longer than 105 minutes. And we do that using several factors. I don't mean uh, to stop you, but boy, that is an incredible amount of time when you think about it. Um, 90 minutes, I, I assume that is each way. Am I wrong about that or am I right about that? That's correct. Okay, so I, I just I, I appreciate your answer. I don't have much time. I just wanted to uh, shine a light on this um, because, uh, you know, uh, uh, Chair Ayala talked about um, the possibility of people um, taking public transportation. That is basically an impossibility uh, in my district um, because even if they managed to get on to public transportation, say took the Q46 of Union Turnpike, to 811, they would still have to walk up Marathon Parkway, uh, which is quite a hill um, in all kinds of weather. So uh, we don't have that luxury. That's why 90% of the households in my district own a car. Um, yeah. It's just not possible. So uh, I, I just wanted uh, to bring that to the fore. And I, I really, um, I'm not going to ask any more questions. Much of what I wanted to talk today was, uh, was covered by the chairs, and I thank them. And um, I, I just hope that in going forward in the future, when we talk about transportation, um, that we can cut down uh, just three hours a day, especially uh, for me, uh, you know, uh, that's what I'm used to in the amount of time I allow to get to City Hall from my house. But for a child with special needs um, on a bus that may not be so comfortable, um, et cetera, et cetera, it's just, um, it, it, it's just really not right. I'll leave it at that. So thank you, chairs. Thank you all. Uh, have a wonderful day um, and a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Councilmember Gudenchik. We will now turn to Councilmember Barron. Time starts now. One moment, Councilmember Barron. If we could unmute Councilmember Barron, and you should see a little window pop up asking you to accept. Can you hear there me we now? go. Okay, yes. good. thank you so much. And thank you for explaining to my colleagues who saw my hand come up afterwards that I had already been in line. Thank you for that. 
I want to thank the chairs, uh, Traeger and Ayala, for conducting this hearing. It's very important. And thank you for the uh, administration's panel to present their testimony and answer the questions. Um, I know that we're in a very challenging time and children who have special needs deserve special attention. Uh, my master's as a part of my preparation for teaching does include a master's in special education. So I do have some firsthand information about some of those challenges. In your earlier part of your, and I want to echo um, council member Chairs Traeger's commendation to the chancellor and all the staff uh, at the administration at Central and to staff at school. In your testimony, if you could be brief with your answers, we only have five minutes. In your testimony, you talked about uh, accommodating loans for people who want to go into teaching. You talked about debt forgiveness and you talked about power advancement. How widespread is this information available to those who are in the system to know that this is an option for them? How are they finding out about this? Councilmember Barron, thank you for, as always, for your support. Uh, I want to just, in, in, for the sake of time, pivot quickly to Lauren Siciliano, our Chief Administrative Officer, so she can directly give you those points. Thank you. Thank you. So um, on the, the transportation power specifically, we will follow up, uh, as we mentioned earlier, with uh, some more specific information on, on uh, those titles in particular. What I will say, though, is that uh, broadly, we are working incredibly closely with schools to ensure that they have the staffing support that they need. Um, and we're doing this through a couple of different strategies. Uh, first, our borough offices are working closely with schools to schedule their um, schedule their funding to hire additional full-time teachers. Um, My question was about the programs for loan, debt forgiveness and encouraging people to know that there are loan opportunities. So. Is that oh my my apologies my apologies I misheard the question okay. um, so we do have programs for both loan forgiveness and uh, debt forgiveness and how is that being communicated to the staff got it um, so we do targeted outreach to folks to participate in those programs so I will get you additional details specifically addressing that question okay I, I would appreciate that because I don't know that that's widely known but to get back to the sh the power situation. I thought I heard testimony saying that there's no power shortage system wide. So I'm Correct. confused as to why there is a shortage for special ed. The two seem to I'm be- I'm sorry, I I'd misheard say. your question. My apologies. No, that, that's a, that, this is a new question. Okay. So, um, so I was referring to, I thought you were asking for um, the follow-up uh, that we had talked about earlier on um, any gaps right. related if, to- If there's no system wide powers. shortage of powers, why is there a problem with special ed powers? No, no, I'm sorry. I was referring to the, um, the transportation power conversation right. that we had earlier. Um, as Christina right. said, there's no system-wide gap. We do have challenges um, uh, in certain areas with uh, powers responding to the posting for that. And so that's all I was referring to. Okay. Um, we understand and we're in agreement with what the challenges and the mission and the goals are for children with IEPs, uh, to give them the best learning opportunities in the least restrictive environment. And with that understanding, I'm concerned as to why we don't hear more specific, targeted, numeric data as to what the situation is for students. If we have a common objective, how are we going to be clear where we are on that path to reaching that objective if we don't have hard data. I was very disappointed that you did not have specific numbers to give to the chairs when they asked. So I would like to have an answer, if not today, uh, as a follow-up. How many students still do not have devices? For example, did you know that council member Ayala's son did not have his device? How many students do not yet have devices? How many students in special education are not receiving all of the mandated services as per their IEP? Yes, I know the IEP was designed for children in the building, but now that we've switched 
and we've shown our flexibility, and our ingenuity, and our creativity. Thank you, creativity to address the needs of our students. How many students are still not receiving all of their mandated services? And we want to have that charted out. How many children are not getting all of these services, and what are those specific services that they're not getting? And in terms of children, particularly living, particularly living in shelters, how many shelters? have connectivity problems that are keeping children from getting online? And how many children, in fact, are in attendance as the chair raised earlier on? So those are some specific questions that at some point I would like to have. And again, I'm disappointed that you didn't come with those numbers to this hearing. Thank you. Thank you to the chairs. Uh, did the DOE want to respond before? Oh, I didn't know if you were. Sorry, uh, go ahead. Yep. Okay, thanks, Marco. Um, so, uh, Councilmember Barron, we will certainly get those um, answers to you and to the chairs. Um, there are, I think there are a couple of things. Um, Christina mentioned also that we were on track to provide the November 1st deadline per city council around the services that students received. And you may recall, we report that both on fully received and partially received so that you have that information. And she shared a little bit around that, some top lines of um, last year, as the chair said, it was 84% and this year. We're um, similar on track. Uh, it's it's um, 82, I, I need to give you the actual point percentage. I don't have that in my uh, handy right now, but so that will be shared certainly with, um, that full report will certainly be shared with the committees uh, and with uh, city council. And you, you also mentioned number of devices in which students, um, I wanna add, ask Lauren to chime in if she would like to, but as you may know, we made available on order 100,000 devices because we were made known of a number, I believe it's 77,000 um, that are needed. And so, as we know about gaps, we continue to do that um, and, and to make sure that we fill those. Um, and we have been working also with the city around it, making sure that we there's connectivity in the shelters. You're absolutely right. That is con a continued challenge and something that's on our minds to make sure that students um, get that uh, support. And I think we also mentioned too that uh, the attendance data was provided for the spring and we are providing that uh, for the council shortly uh, with my colleagues support. So Lauren, did you wanna add anything else on the devices? And I, I, I know that didn't uh, give you all the answers, but I tried, to, I wanna make sure I hit at a high level each of the, the data uh, requests that you made. Yes, thank you, Linda. Um, everything you shared was obviously spot on in terms of devices. We are continuing to work with schools to confirm their needs. And as Linda mentioned, we've ordered an additional 100,000 iPads. Um, and throughout this process, we have and we will continue to prioritize students with disabilities um, for those devices because we know how critical that is. Um, uh, on the questions you asked about the shelters, yes, we are uh, reviewing the shelters now so that uh, when there are connectivity issues, we can swap out SIM cards from one internet service provider to another. We've also created a, a family help desk, uh, added capacity there that will help us resolve uh, additional issues that come up from families, uh, particularly for students in shelter. Um, and then one piece, just while I, I'm unmuted and have a moment, I did wanna go back and share one of the specific uh, pieces of information that Chair Traeger had asked for earlier. Uh, and my apologies for not having it in front of me at the time. Um, there was a question about the breakdown on medical accommodations that uh, staff have received. Um, last week, I mentioned 34,000 accommodation requests had been approved for staff. Um, that breaks down to 19,000 teachers, um, about 7,200 paras, 230 principals, 620 APs, um, and then a mix of other pedagogues and other staff. Um, and I'd be happy to, to share more information on that. One piece that I did want to clarify in sharing those numbers is that just because a staff member has been approved for a reasonable accommodation doesn't mean that that is a staffing gap. In fact, all of our staff who are on reasonable accommodations are supporting students remotely. Um, 
So I just wanted to make that clear. Um, I'm happy to talk more uh, later about uh, all of the efforts we're doing to ensure schools have the staffing they need, but I did wanna share that data now and, and my apologies again that I didn't have it earlier. So I, I just, I thank you. I, I took notes on that um, just very quickly. Uh, did I hear correct that you mentioned 7,200 power professionals have been granted medical accommodations? Is that correct? Can we unmute Lauren again, please? My apologies. Yes, 7,200 7, paras. And does anyone have data? How many total paras do we have in, in the system? Um, I can absolutely get that data for you. So uh, I, this is again, someone, I, I am a, a son of a retired paraprofessional and my father is a retired District 75 teacher. So I know a little bit about this and I'm a former teacher myself. There are certain services that paras and, and I absolutely value and appreciate our amazing paraprofessional community, but there are certain services that paraprofessionals provide kids that are in person that I don't know how that's provided virtually. So are we experiencing a paraprofessional shortage as part of the staffing and, and that has a direct impact on IEP mandates? So Chair, so, I'll, I'll begin. Okay. Oh, sorry. Lauren. No, go ahead, Linda. Oh. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right that there are are um, various roles and, and essential functions that paraprofessionals serve and some that are that don't work as well in a remote situation. So for instance, like a health para or something like of that nature that's in-person services. So what we do is also balance um, and to the extent possible based on, uh, on capacity, assign paras to students appropriate to the student's services and also the other consideration is sometimes when a student, uh, a one-to-one -one para or a health para, um, it also depends on where the student is in person or remote. So if the student is remote, the para works with that student in a remote setting. And if they're in person, we make sure that a para that is not on a reasonable accommodation is assigned to that, that student. So, so know that we try to make sure Sure, and principals are very keen to do this to align staff's capacity in terms of paras to the needs of the student. So in some cases, if I'm the para that always have served this particular student for the last year, because I'm on reasonable accommodation, I might be shifted in such a way so that that student gets what they need, if that makes but, sense. But, but Dr. Chen, last question, and then I'll be mindful of my colleagues' time because of the staffing shortages experienced in schools, and I'm hearing this anecdotally, I wanna he hear if you've heard the same, because of the severe staffing shortages experienced in schools, um, have you heard, are you aware of paraprofessionals being asked to basically supervise a study hall, a virtual study hall, because of the severe teacher shortages, meaning that if in a, in a high school, middle school, if the if there is no licensed teacher to teach the course, the teacher is working from home, and the kids are logging on to Zoom in the class, they still need adult supervision. And from what I'm hearing, because of the severe staffing shortages, even folks like paraprofessionals who are not licensed uh, to supervise children on their own, they need a teacher with them present. Um, are being asked to just watch the class because they don't have enough staff working in schools. Are you aware of this? Have you heard of this? I am aware of extenuating circumstances, Chair, um, similar to what you're expressing. Um, as to how far spread that is, it's not my understanding uh, that that is the case in every school building by any stretch. However, we do have some extenuating circumstances. Let's say it's a particular license course in a high school, and that's the only teacher in the school building, but that teacher is on a reasonable accommodation. So the students who are coming in are sometimes, and you're asking if I've heard of the situation, I have heard of a situation where the teacher is 
coming in on Zoom with the students who are in person. And then whether it's another teacher or sometimes if uh, needed in an extenuating circumstance, a paraprofessional, those are some things that we also worked out in partnership with the UFT to make it doable. Again, that is something that is an extenuating circumstance issue and not the norm. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop here to my colleagues, but it will be helpful to know what the actual staffing demand number is. I appreciate the breakdown as far as medical accommodation, but we need to know what the number, the demand is for how much staff our schools need, because I am hearing and it's more than just one or two schools that folks are being pulled in different directions to try to, you know, just put a, an adult in a room to watch kids when in fact they're not really getting in-person services. So I'll, I'll turn it over back to my colleagues. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from Councilmember Lewis, followed by Councilmember Borelli and Councilmember Levin. If we could go ahead and unmute Councilmember Lewis, please. Good afternoon. I'm Thank sorry. you, Chair. Thank you, Chairs uh, Traeger and Ayala for hosting this very important hearing today, and I want to thank the administration for making themselves available to answer these questions today. Um, I know the question was asked already, and I heard the response that the DOE supplied 12,500 assisted technology to IEP students. I had the same question, but mine was geared toward um, the most recent shutdown. So I wanted to know if the administration could share um, what percentage of students with IEPs that attended schools, particularly in the red zones that didn't have electronic devices during the most recent shutdown. Um, and the second question I had was, when, are, when do you all think um, the schools that were impacted that fall within the red zones are scheduled to reopen and how can we get students with disabilities and IEPs back on track? And the third question, because I only have five minutes, um, the number of, do we know the number of students uh, under the care of school psychologists in our DOE schools um, were not served during the most recent shutdown? Do we have a particular percentage? We know a lot of students, when, once they opted into the blend, blended learning component and started school in the fall, a lot of them needed services and were assigned school psychologists, but then most recently, some of the schools in the red zones had to shut down. So I wanted to know, are you all tracking that information? Thank you, Council Member Lewis, for the questions. And absolutely, the, the, the is important when at any point in time, whether it's a red zone situation or others, I'm going to, to ask, um, we're, I'll start and break the questions down, the responses down a little bit for Katie generally from um, DCSW to provide a little bit more detail around the protocols around the red zones. And then uh, Christina to add anything I may have missed around school psychologists. But um, as uh, the chair had asked previously on what contingency plans for, for instance. So at any point in time, we, we knew for health and safety reasons, we could be shut down for in-person. And therefore, there were plans around remote services and instruction and infrastructures for that, that schools defaulted into in the event that they would go for a complete shutdown of in-person learning. And so that is part of what we also did in these schools cases. I will tell you that um, we will need to get you the information on this very specifics of percentage of students of IEPs in red zones and those without devices. We wanna make sure we get that precise number for you. Um, and then in terms of the school psychologists, there are also a number of different protocols that we have worked with psychologists on, both provi providing guidance from Christina's office, but I would also say psychologists themselves have been partnering with us to, to garner some of the best practices to share across as well. So I'm gonna start by pivoting to Katie around some of the particulars around the protocols for Red Zone and then um, Christina for anything around psychologists to add. Thank you, Linda. So as you uh, uh, know, the zones are uh, decided by the state and we're complying with their guidance here, which is at the moment that uh, uh, those uh, schools continue to be fully remote. They're not uh, acting in person. We'll continue to work with them every day to see when we can get them back online. We do, the health department does see um, some encouraging data in those areas. I think uh, this was reviewed yesterday by both the state and the city. There has been a, a, a you know, 
positive data coming out of there. Uh, so we'll continue to work with them and, and keep everybody posted when we know. I don't know if Christina is, can be unmuted. Yes, thank you. Council Member Lewis, thank you for your question. I just would expand uh, the scope of your question to, um, as I heard it to be about uh, counseling services, whether uh, a number of different roles in our system play provide those mandated counseling services, psychologists, social workers, um, some of our guidance counselors. Uh, last year, we ended the school year um, with 90, about approximately 91% of our students uh, receiving all of their mandated counseling services. Uh, again, as I said earlier, we will not stop until we're at 100%. And those students who did not receive their mandated counseling services uh, during uh, from our school providers are entitled to uh, RSA services outside of the school. What about during the most recent shutdown, are you all tracking that information? Because while kids had to endure um, remote learning and all the changes during, sorry, some of the changes during COVID, I wanna know, I wanna make sure that we're tracking all of that information. So if you could share that with us at some point, that would be helpful. Thank you, everyone. Yes, council member, we'd be happy to share that with you. And that is all part of our, our reporting obligations that we will fulfill. Thank you, council member Lewis. Next, we will hear from council member Borelli. If we could unmute council member Borelli, please. Uh, thank you. I, I heard the Chairwoman Ayala asking earlier uh, in this hearing uh, about mandatory testing and the stress that that uh, that brings upon some students. Last hearing, I asked where the DOE gets the authority to mandate testing. I mean, as as we know, um, entering a school is a constitutional right for a New York State student, and I specifically asked the chancellor where you get the authority to mandate testing um, and require consent uh, to be tested. And the chancellor's response to me was that he would get back to me in writing. Um, however, uh, it's been over a week. I think at the time I received a text message saying I'd be told that by the end of the day. So can you answer that question for us of where the DOE gets the authority to require testing? Council Member Borelli, thank you for the question. And I know that uh, my colleagues in the Chancellor's Office is getting a response back to you. And I would also say that we work very closely with our sister agencies in the city to be able to make sure that any health and safety procedures are done certainly in, a, in tandem under that authority as well. Uh, Katie, uh, if you wanna add something to that, please feel free. No, I think that sums it up. Well, we, we've been testing for, for a couple of weeks now. So presumably the DOE established how they have the legal authority to do that before they started, correct? Yes. And what would have to be prepared to, to give me? Would... So right now, uh, as you know, we uh, parents sign a consent form to be a part of testing. Uh, and that's uh, a regular procedure for us in the sense that they sign other consent forms for other health services in the building. Uh, as of right now, uh, you know, we're working through the with the consents that we have. And, uh, you know, we want to give parents time to adjust to that uh, before we make any further decisions about, you know, mandating it uh, for in, in person or not in person. Um, the, the mayor of Washington, Mayor Bowser, uh, she reported today that her kindergartners saw a 22% decline in literacy rates uh, of those students using remote learning. Do we test literacy in K through two and have the rates dropped in a similar way? So um, literacy is, as you're noting, is of paramount importance for all of our learners and especially our students with disabilities. And we have a number of formative assessments uh, that are provided. And I think you're asking specifically around the kindergarten through second grade, the early literacy um, initiatives. So we have a number of different ways that our schools track the literacy levels of students. And we also, in, in partnership with our universal literacy program, have devised some guidance for schools, especially in the remote situation too. As you've noted, um, being able to 
uh, assess a student's reading level remotely takes on some additional challenges than in person. And those are some things that we've been providing schools guidance with and the schools follow that closely to be able to provide differentiated supports for students. Do, do, we, do we have rates? Do we have a metric to, to, to report? We don't track, um, there isn't one single assessment that every student uses and therefore we can track and compare across. Uh, there are multiple forms of information that are collected by schools to do that. And the schools at their level know where students are in terms of their reading levels. So do we have any idea of whether the, the actual learning that's taking place has decreased in some capacity, yeah, the, the, how the results were. I mean, there has to be a way to tell whether we're doing good or we're doing bad. And the question is, are we doing good when it comes to kids in grades K through two with respect to reading and, and of course, math and, and all the other subjects? So our, our teachers and our, our, our school principals have uh, periodic assessments and inform informal assessment procedures at the school level and they track. So for instance, part of it includes listening to a student read and read in terms of the rate of their reading and the accuracy in terms of phonics, um, as well as their comprehension. So all of those are factors that every teacher checks, especially in the K-2 grades. Um, in addition to that part of if you're asked like how do we know we know because we provide additional resources so for instance foundational uh, reading strategies and teaching of those skills take on some different considerations when it comes to the remote learning space and, and just a, a yes. simple question the, the mayor of washington said that she saw according to their metrics a 22 percent decline in literacy rates can you say that our rates of however we measure uh, success in terms of literacy, can we say that our rates have not gone down since we switched to predominantly remote learning? Time expired. So I'll, can I just finish answering that question? Uh, we, um, I don't know what the mayor of Washington DC is using as her metric in terms of comparison. Oh, we, we, we definitely use something. So did our rates go down? We, as I said before, Councilman Burley, we don't have one single measure that every school uses. It's different. So like in terms of like there's, there's state exams there where we can compare across. We don't have one single assessment that every single kindergarten, first and second grader takes that we can compare overall rates. So how do we know remote learning is working for kids then? And I guess that's what I'm really asking. We know that our schools are providing those differentiated supports. I, I you know, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly that um, there are additional challenges in the remote learning space. Um, you know, there's, there's no way to deny that. That is also why we have really um, prioritized and put a, quite a bit of effort into in-person learning so that we have that available option to every family that can, can engage in that. Um, but in terms of actually having a, a firm metric that we can stand by and say, every kid was given this assessment and this is what we know. We don't have that measure, but we do have at the local level, every school knows which students are on grade level and, so and if are the not. The goal is to get better in-person learning for more kids. In the last 21 days, there's three studies out saying that schools aren't super spreaders. The mayor and governor have conceded that schools aren't super spreaders. Your own data in testing has conceded uh, that schools aren't super spreaders. So if the science, the, the elected leaders uh, and our own testing isn't indicating that we should continue with this constant remote learning, why don't we just open up to all kids who want to be there? I think you've seen us um, uh, engage quite a bit of effort to get in person uh, to be uh, safe. And, um, and that's why you see those low numbers, uh, quite frankly. Now, I do also uh, think that responsibly in terms of as educators, we need to make sure that remote learning is a viable option because at any point, in this pandemic, we don't know. I mean, New York City made great gains from being the epicenter to, you know, the very low rates we have, especially in our schools, as, as you've very much noted here. We want to make sure that there is solid remote learning that in the event, uh, and as the previous uh, Council Member Lewis mentioned too, when there's a red zone shutdown, that, that we have a reliable and responsible method of educating students in the remote space as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Borelli. And finally, we will hear from Councilmember Levin. If we could please unmute Councilmember Levin. 
Time starts now. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to ask, follow up on Chair Traeger's questions around um, uh, children in shelter. Um, we talked a little bit at the last hearing about um, the ability that the uh, DOE has to replace some SIM cards, some T-Mobile SIM cards with Verizon SIM cards. Um, the chancellor made reference to 10 shelters. Um, we know that it's happening at one shelter, but there are um, many, you know, there's dozens of shelters that, that house um, children all across the city, um, school children. Do we, do we, um, do we have a clear picture of, of how many shelters have reported um, uh, internet capacity issues? Council Member Levin, thank you for the question. In the sake of time, I'm just gonna pivot quickly to Lauren Siciliano. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to talk about this. And uh, as you know, since we have started doing the iPad distribution, our students in shelter have been the first students to receive them. And we work very closely with uh, our partners at DHS and DSS to uh, coordinate those deliveries. Um, as the chancellor mentioned uh, last week, the list of 10 shelters was uh, an initial list based mm -hmm. on uh, information that we had from our partners around the um, connectivity challenges at those sites. That by no means means that those are the only 10 that we're looking at, but those were the 10 that we were starting with um, given the, the connectivity issues at those sites. And uh, in some cases, um, we are able to resolve the issues without changing the SIM card. In cases mm -hmm. where we do, we're able to swap those out. Okay, do, um, do, but do we have a, I mean, what, I, what I'm looking for is a, a kind of a comprehensive list of technological challenges that um, have been identified in, in shelters, specifically by the shelter and kind of what those action, you know, what, what remediations have taken place there. So, um, and, and I would love to be able to, to see anything like that. So just kind of a clear and comprehensive um, uh, accounting um, so that we can be, um, you know, very confident on our end that no child in shelter is uh, is losing out any more than they already are. Absolutely understand that. And we of course share your goal. Um, so I will mm -hmm. take that question back and, and see what we have. Yeah, if we can get a, a comprehensive accounting. I mean, I really wanna know shelter by shelter, um, what, you know, what, what the problems are that have been identified and how they're being addressed. Um, yeah, and I'd like to I'd be, like to see that as as quickly as possible. So if, if we could follow up on that, that would be very appreciated. Understood. I will share that uh, question back with our partners at DHS and see what we can provide. Okay. Thanks so much. Sure. Um, seeing no further hands, um, Councilmember Traeger, I will turn it back to you. Yeah, I, I just. Uh wanted to um, just note for the record that it is my view that a big part of the reason why we're experiencing a severe staff shortage, which again is impacting a lot of kids, is because of the choice to implement this hybrid model. Um, you know, we, we are absolutely, there's no question we're facing challenges with the pandemic. Um, there's no question that uh, we have a lot of a lot of hard work and dedicated staff that are in high risk categories and folks that certainly need medical accommodations. But in my analysis of this model, uh, you basically require three sets of educators, three sets of folks, uh, one group for a cohort A on a Monday, a different group for a cohort B on a Tuesday. They need an entire group through, through on their remote days. And I know that um, there have been changes as far as what was promised to kids even on the remote days who opted for, for, the, for the blended learning because of the staff shortages. And um, 
I, I, I will go back to, I, I think that this model needs, needs to be revisited immediately. It's, it's just, it's not working. It's not clicking. And I, I'm not saying this from, from a point of, of just, you know, playing gotcha or this is not a game to me. This is serious. I'm sure I speak to all my colleagues that we get the calls from, from families and educators and people who, who, who are, who want better for their kids. And of course we have to manage safety in a pandemic, but, um, you know, ego and pride should not get in the way. I think we have to do what's best immediately for kids. The system is not working. Um, and it, it, it requires exponentially more staff at a time when we're also in a fiscal crisis. And a lot of folks who are being granted medical accommodations under, for understandable reasons. Um, and uh, I, I just, I, I will continue. I think my colleagues will continue to push for this advocacy for transparency but we need a lot more information than we uh, got today. Uh, we still don't have the attendance. We still don't have the percentage. And as mentioned by Ms. Foti, they'll get us something by November as far as the percentage of compliance. I just want to note again for the record that even when folks bring up numbers of 84%, 85%, we're still talking about thousands of kids not getting services. And even when folks use the language of partial services, partial is not full and kids deserve full resources, full, full accommodations. And these are mandates. So um, I will, you know, just continue to follow up and to, and we use whatever tool in the council that we have, um, whether it's legislation, the council has used before subpoena power to get information. We'll use every tool in our toolbox to get information as soon as possible on behalf of our children. Um, so thank you uh, for, for your time testimony today and Malcolm, we will move on with the next panel. Oh, is, is my co-chair has any closing remarks to the administration? I do not. Thank, thank you, you. co-chair. Okay, thank you, Department of Education. We appreciate it. We will follow up soon. Um, we are now going to turn to the very patient uh, public witnesses that we have that have been uh, standing by and are eager to testify. So as I reminded uh, everyone at the beginning of this hearing, I'm going to be calling you in panels. Um, we ask for council members that have questions for individual panelists, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call you in the order with which you raise your hand uh, when the panel has concluded their testimony in full. Everyone will be given two minutes to testify. Please wait until you hear the Sergeant at Arms give you the cue to begin. And when the two minutes is up, we just ask that you please wrap up your final thoughts so we can move on to the next panelist. So for our first public panel, we have Mary Jo Janisi from the UFT, Randy Levine, Advocates for Children, Maggie Maroff, the Arise Coalition, Lori Podvesker, Include New York City, Ellen McHugh, Citywide Council on Special Education. We will first start with Mary Jo. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Well, first of all, I want to thank the chairs, Mark Traeger and Diana Ayala, and for putting this together. And I appreciate as a former occupational therapist in the Department of Education for many years, I appreciate your understanding of the value of providing individualized attention and services to our students. And it's already been stated that in many school settings, there's a huge struggle for students to get the services that they are required to receive. So I'll be succinct. I, first, I just wanna say that our educators do need the tools to do what they're being asked to do. So a lot of the devices that they have, whether laptops that have been provided, they don't have the, uh, the camera range or the auditory ability to really capture a, a true environment where students could completely interact with each other as an entire class. Also, our students need a tremendous amount of support in the use of technology, as we've heard as well. And from meeting with groups of teachers, we're finding that the 20 minutes that are allocated in the day for office hours, which should be a good time to discuss with parents the intricacies of students' academic progress or the pad, as Christina mentioned, that time's not being utilized for that. Rather, it's being used to help families and students troubleshoot many, many tech issues. I would be remiss if I also didn't mention the staffing shortage, as you mentioned, Chairman, the, related to the models. It, it, there's, a, there's a significant issue here 
where our teachers are responsible for lesson plans, specially designed instruction, outreach to families, for students that are right before them in person, for the students that when they're not in person, but are at home and for fully remote students. So all of this is taking a tremendous amount of time for our teachers and therefore they're, they're not able to give the amount of instruction that ideally they would want to give because of this. So I just wanna, in closing, I'm uh, sorry. So you could go ahead and uh, wrap up. Yeah, you can wrap up your final statement. Sure. Oh yeah, so I just wanted to ask for your support as, an, as allies in government to help the Department of Ed cut down the wait time on their tech helpline to consider that every school needs a tech expert, a designated tech expert, and to encourage tech companies like Google to listen to educators because there are some very good suggestions they have that could make the management of the classroom much better. And lastly, to urge administrators to continue hiring staff and also to look at the qualified staff that are currently in out of classroom positions. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Jo. Next, we will hear from Randy Levine, Advocates for Children. If we could unmute Randy, please. Clock is ready. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Randy Levine. I'm the Policy Director of Advocates for Children of New York. We recognize the immense challenge of reopening the nation's largest public school system and know that many DOE staff members and educators have been working extremely hard and appreciate that. At the same time, we are gravely concerned about the impact of the pandemic on students with disabilities. Since the school year began, we have assisted hundreds of families. While many parents are relieved that their children are back in school and others are relieved to continue remotely, we have heard about a range of concerns. This month, we heard from families whose children's IEPs mandate classes of no more than 12 students who are in remote classes with double or triple that number spanning up to four grade levels. Families pleading for more in-person instruction because their children are losing skills, including a child with autism who spends remote learning throwing their iPad. Families who chose blended learning to get in-person services, but were only offered remote services, including one parent who described his kindergarten students' remote physical therapy as pointless. Families whose children are not getting their mandated services, including a child whose IEP mandates three sessions of sets per week, but has received a total of two sessions this year. Families whose children are receiving minimal remote live instruction and are being pulled out for remote related services, including a student whose speech therapy is scheduled for the same time as his one hour per day of live class instruction. Families of students whose ICT classes are being taught only by a general education teacher or not being taught at all on days of remote learning. Families who have been waiting months for evaluations, including a parent who first requested an evaluation last February before schools closed. Families who cannot understand their program adaptations document because it's not translated in the language they speak. Families whose students have been waiting for iPads since as far back as July. Families offered a learning bridges seat only to be told illegally by the program that it could not meet their child's needs including a child with autism who was turned away. And there are more examples in our written testimony. It's hard to overstate how much work there is to do to help students with disabilities now and as the city recovers. We will be looking to the city council to help get the data needed to better understand problems and target solutions, to shine a spotlight on the impact of this pandemic on students with disabilities and advocate on their behalf, to secure desperately needed resources to better meet their needs, and to ensure students get the compensatory services to which they are entitled to make up for the learning time they have lost and are continuing to lose and get students back on track. Thank you for focusing today's hearing on students with disabilities. We appreciate the ongoing work the council has Please done. Expire. We appreciate the ongoing work the council has done to draw attention to the needs of students with disabilities to secure needed resources and look forward to continuing to partner with you. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. And next, we will hear from Maggie Maroff from the Arise Coalition. Clock is ready. Good afternoon. Thank you. I'm Maggie Maroff, and I coordinate the Arise Coalition. The last eight months have been traumatic for DOE staff, families, many of whom you'll hear from today, and of course, students and students with disabilities have been disproportionately impacted. 
I'd like to stress four things today a little bit different than what we've been hearing about. Sharing information with parents, school staff working with parents to develop and share pads, giving parents access to their children's individual CSIS accounts, and gathering data. First, the DOE needs to share real-time coherent information with parents in varied languages through multiple means of communication and in a timely way. This shouldn't be left to overwhelm school staff who seem to be learning it all right alongside the rest of us. We appreciate the Office of Special Education's Beyond Access series and the changes that have been made to the website, but they're not enough. Information needs to go out through mailings and texts and emails and phone calls and public service announcements in all the languages that New York's diverse population speak. Next, the DOE must ensure that schools truly seek parents' input in developing those pads that we heard about. They must provide parents with copies of those pads right away, and they should be translating the child-specific information in those pads for families as needed. We also call on the DOE to give parents access to their children's CSIS accounts so that parents can review the actual rollout and provision of services that their kids are getting right now in real time. We understand that this is in the works, but parents shouldn't have to wait any longer for this really critical information. And then lastly, the city, as, as you discussed earlier, the city needs to collect, analyze, and public, publicly report data with regard to remote and hybrid learning. We were really glad to see the bill that Chair Traeger introduced, which would require reporting around remote learning. Time is expired. And briefly, to strengthen that, we urge that the data breakdowns be disaggregated by disability status, include disaggregated attendance rates, and include data on the extent and nature of paraprofessional support being provided in person and remotely. We believe that all of this will help ensure the delivery of services now and um, the, the delivery of compensatory services later. My written testimony has a whole lot more. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Maggie. And next we'll hear from Lori from Include NYC. Doc is ready. Hi everybody, uh, I'd like to thank both counts, both committees for holding this important hearing on reopening the schools and its impact on students with disabilities. My name is Laura Podvesker and I'm the Director of Policy at Include NYC. And I'm also the parent of a near 18 year old uh, who attends a District 75 high school program. While we commend the mayor and the chancellor for their efforts to return 1.1 million children to classrooms during a global public health pandemic, economic crisis, and civil and emotional unrest, we testify today with great urgency for City Hall to prioritize the education of nearly 300,000 students with disabilities ages 3 through 21 in New York City right now and for the long term, at least for the next 10 years as our city recovers from COVID-19. While COVID-19 and remote and blended learning have disrupted the lives of all students and their families, students with disabilities have been the most affected by these, these disruptions. Changes in routines and loss in in-person instruction, supports, and services have placed additional barriers to a quality education in a system that pre-pandemic was already failing our students. The pandemic has greatly exasperated the pre-existing achievement gap between general education students and students with disabilities. Last spring, when the pandemic first hit and remote learning was in place for all students in the school system, parents of students with disabilities became special education teachers, speech therapists, occupational therapists, physical therapists, mental health counselors, and the main source of interaction for their kids. Parents were required to take on these roles all while surviving day to day and keeping their families and themselves healthy, safe, housed, fed, clothed, and employed. This was if they were fortunate enough to have a job and or keep an existing job with all the new and competing priorities. One parent said, buying food, paying rent, internet and electricity, trying to make sure my son is not becoming anxious about what is happening are my biggest challenges. Another parent said, I want my child to actually learn something and for the therapist to fulfill the mandates instead of telling me in front of my child that services were optional. There's a lot more I can say too, like Maggie said, um, that's in our written testimony. Um, and just wanna highlight some other issues, which um, is the issue for stronger communications, uh, both school-based and from central um, on very basic things. Um, right before schools reopened, we heard from a lot of families who didn't know what their 
schedule was going to be like at their child's school, didn't have access to busing information, didn't know the names of teacher and therapist, and this isn't okay. And for non-English speaking families, there's even more barriers. Um, one other thing just want to draw quick attention to is that we've seen a huge increase um, in calls from parents and professionals uh, the last seven months, almost a 200% increase based on the need. And we've also seen an increase on the number of calls from families and professionals of kids in District 75 programs. We're looking for information on residential programs um, for their children who would otherwise remain at home. And I think that's very telling of what's happening. Um, that's all we have for now. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lori. And next we will hear from Ellen McHugh from the Citywide Council on Special Education. Clock is ready. Good afternoon. Thank you for the time. And thank you for holding the hearing. My name is Ellen McHugh and I'm the co-chair of the Citywide Council on Special Education. As we all know, and as we have heard today, the opening of schools has been particularly rocky for students with IEP. While many may disagree with me, I believe that staff are making a good faith effort to provide the services and satisfy the needs of students with mandates on their IEP. Their skills may range from mediocre to excellent, but the vast majority are dedicated and desire a positive outcome. While we must recognize the missteps and mishaps that have occurred, I do believe we can use our intelligence guided by our experience to improve on the methods that work. A glaring issue for all parents of all students is the fact that no parents were included in the negotiations with the DOE and their labor partners when plans were being made. A chancellor who touts his respect for parent leadership at the local and citywide level has yet and did not or could not advocate for that leadership to be part of the planning. One problem for parents and students with disabilities is the equipment provided for remote learning. Many of the devices are equipped with accessibility adaptations for those with individuals. These programs are not available across the board to all students. They have either been blocked or not loaded onto devices. Speech to text, large print availability, closed captioning, or for pre-recorded lessons or read aloud programs for students with learning disabilities cannot be activated. Most surprising to me is that spell check, word check, word suggestions, language corrections are not available on most devices given to students. These are programs that a typical person or student using a typical device at home or at work has easy access to all day, every day. These are examples of universal design. Time is UDL is a framework to improve and optimize teaching and learning for all people based on scientific insights on how humans learn. It benefits all students, advanced, struggling, or with learning disabilities. Enabling or preloading these programs will benefit all of the students who receive um, re these devices. On behalf of the students and parents, we all want to serve. We and, and C Learn, I am asking for your help in ensuring that the devices come fully enabled for our students with special needs. Thank you again. Thank you. And that concludes the testimony for this panel. I will turn it to Chair Traeger and Chair Ayala. I, first of all, thank you to this extraordinary panel. Uh, I look to many of you also for your great information and insight and advocacy and uh, a lot of it shapes our advocacy. So I really wanna thank all of you, I consider all of you to be uh, partners and, and I learned from you. So I wanna thank all of you. Um, one quick question if, if anyone's, I, I'm hearing anecdotally again, but I'm just wondering if anyone else has heard this, that um, some families have expressed concerns about the burdensome supply list that they're being asked to purchase or to try to obtain uh, to comply with school requirements for this hybrid model. Uh, as we heard before, um, many kids need more adaptive technology to, to conduct remote learning because you, know, you can't really type on iPads or it's, um, but some schools are, are asking parents and families, well, that's a part of your supply list, go out and buy it. And that really disproportionately impacts or hurts working class folks 
we might not have the means to buy stuff that in the past would just be a couple of pencils and pens and paper, but now has become more expensive in terms of trying to, to comply with uh, this remote hybrid. Uh, had, had anyone heard about burdens on families in terms of what is being asked of them? I see Ellen raising her hand, so I'll call on uh, Ellen first. Thanks, Ellen. Not only are they being asked to provide equipment or paper, pencils, et cetera, et cetera, they're not being given the equipment that they need to use at home. My son is deaf. FM units are necessary and can be lent out. They are being told, nope, too bad, good night, good luck. That's too expensive to give to you. It's not said quite as rudely as that, but that's the impact. And yes, people are being asked, including downloading um, programs that cost 30, 40, 50 dollars. You know, I, if they can download it, all well and good, but you know, that's a lot of money, especially if you've got two, three kids in the house. I, and downloading them on each device may cost you money as well. I'm sorry, it's very frustrating. No, uh, Ellen, thank you, because I'm that's that's how I learn, and I've heard it from some folks in my district. And I'm I'm just trying to compile this. So if anyone else has any additional things or stories, um, I will make a note of it, and I will follow up with DOE accordingly. Because parents and kids are going through a lot, and we should not be putting any more burdens and challenges on their plate right now. Uh, if anyone else has anything to say on that, I, I'd appreciate it. I see Maggie raising her hand. Yeah, I mean, so not on that specifically, but I think that you raise a really interesting point and, you know, and it's it's what Lori talked about a little bit more in detail, which is just how much is being asked of families right now. You know, they're working as teachers and service providers and counselors and all while doing, you know, their work as parents and while doing their work as, employees somewhere else and being parents to other kids. So I think that that's just part of a whole package of things that are making this task next to impossible for so I'm not impossible because families are hu superhuman and, and they are seeing their way through it, but making it so difficult for those families. Totally. And if I could just add to that, you know, my personal experience uh, working full time doing advocacy work and parenting an almost 18 year old guy who's nonverbal and um, not too independent, um, the quality of remote instruction is so inferior that I have to say there's a big part of me that is ready to abandon that um, every other week because it's not worth the calorie is not worth the squeeze and not worth the outcomes that we're getting. Um, and also just figuring out technology. Again, um, I'm an educated, privileged person. I used to teach um, general ed and special ed. And it takes me a long time to figure out how to access each class and the associated platforms. And so I think if I'm having such a hard time doing this, what is the majority of families in our system experiencing? Um, and I, I think it says a lot. Thank, thank you, Lori. And uh, final thing uh, to the panel who I respect a lot. Um, I shared a proposal, a vision back in July. Uh, I worked on it with a number of educators, uh, parents, families in, in, in my community. Um, and it's, it's a proposal. I, I don't assume to have all the answers. This is a, and I'm not a public health expert, but I did wait to read the state uh, education department and state health department guidance and made sure it was consistent with that. And I see a number of school districts across America adopting versions of what I proposed and shared, a phased in approach, providing more services for uh, younger children and children with special needs and, and children in temporary housing. Just curious to hear folks' thoughts on um, their thoughts on what I shared compared to the hybrid model, which I really think is an issue here. That's not really meeting the, as we as we hear, it's not really equitable. It's not really meeting the needs of kids who need it the most and of, of working parents. I also want to add a category of people. Um, I know as a former high school teacher, a number of my students were caretakers for their younger siblings. And with remote learning, many high school students have taken on additional responsibilities. 
Some of them are now working to help mom or dad pay rent, put food on the table. Many of them are helping their younger brothers and sisters with remote learning at the expense of their own instruction. And that also weighs heavy on me because I have spoken to some high school seniors who were supposed to be celebrating this year, uh, but are now caring for sick relatives and watching their younger siblings giving, uh, providing childcare services because you know mom or dad have to work. So just curious to hear folks, folks' opinions and thoughts on a, a, a true phased in approach providing more options for elementary children with special needs, early childhood, um, as compared to the hybrid model. Thank you. Maggie, anyone? Apparently I like speaking today. Um, thank you. You know, we've been thinking about this recently and um, we were pleased to see the DOE prioritizing students, some of the students with, with high special ed needs um, by opening up the District 75 schools earlier on and making that a little bit more available. We do think that, um, and sorry, right now I'm talking as my role as special ed policy coordinator at Advocates for Children and not necessarily on behalf of the Arise Coalition. Um, but we do think that if students have high enough needs to merit um, a self-contained placement, whether it's in District 75 or the community schools, then they probably also need those additional options and supports. I think that's what you were getting at a little bit. Um, so um, whether or not a student lands in District 75 or in a specialized program, for example, in District 1 through 32 is a matter of a whole number of factors. And it does, the fact that they are in, if they're lucky enough to be in a program like ASD, Nest, or Horizon, they're still in the District 1 through 32 programs. They still have those needs that are very high and probably merit some additional in-person time in school. Thank you, Maggie. Anyone else? Randy? I'll just add quickly, we deeply appreciate your work to shine a light on the need for equity this year and in school reopening. Um, and we at Advocates for Children have, have been concerned that the school reopening plan hasn't been centered on equity. And as you know, we hear concerns not only from families of students with disabilities, but families of English language learners, students in shelter, students in foster care, and we hear from families who are glad that they have the option for full-time remote instruction. And we hear from families who desperately want more time in school. Um, and just to give one quick example, we're working with a student now who's in kindergarten and his parent chose blended learning because remote instruction has been so challenging for him. And he was only offered one day a week of in-person learning and he's in a 12 student class and his parent is finding remote learning incredibly challenging. He was this past week offered a seat in a learning bridge program. His parent besides her own need to work thought that the learning bridge program could potentially provide him with some additional support but called the program and was told we don't support students with autism um, and you can't go here. Um, and so we're certainly working to help that individual child. But I think it shows how as we move forward this year and as we go into the next quarter, we have to think about what more we can do, including offering more in-person instruction for students who need that additional support. And, you know, really appreciate your efforts, Chair Traeger and Chair Ayala. This year. <laughs> Oh, the, the, the sounds of New York. New York is not a ghost town after all, right? <laughs> uh, does my co-chair Ayala have a comment? I, I, I saw you, I saw you were, I want to say a few words, and then Ellen had a few words. Yeah, I don't have any further questions. I think you guys were very thorough, um, but I wanted to thank you for coming to today's hearing and staying and um, really uh, contributing so nicely to this conversation um, and just really appreciative to have all of you out there uh, advocating for families um, every single day. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, thank you. And Ellen, the final word for this panel? 
think we're using soft language to hide harsh realities. We talk about synchronous and asynchronous, blended, not blended, hybrid, uh, in person, uh, all kinds of vague statements about what a child can benefit from. And yet, when we translate those things to families, they are dumbfounded at the lack. We, I believe people are trying, I really, really do. But I think that direction from City Hall has slowed down information. I think direction from City Hall has lessened information and I think direction from City Hall has made people so cautious about saying anything that the only words they can use are soft words to express a harsh reality. Well said. Thank you very much, Ellen. Appreciate you. Thank, thanks, thanks to the entire panel. Next panel. Thank you. Uh, for the next panel, actually, uh, chairs, we uh, got a late email from a student that wants to join us from District 75. So the next panel will be Lucas Healy, Tanisha Grant, Paulette Healy, Amber Decker, and Jessamine Lee. And we will first start with our student, Lucas Healy. Doc is ready. Um, he may have dropped off, it looks like. I don't see him. So what we'll do is we will go to Tanisha Grant, and then if Lucas pops back in, we will go to him um, after Tanisha. So if we can, there we go. Thank you, Chairman Trigger. Um, every day I'm gaining more and more respect for you, and I appreciate that. Thank you for donating to our laptop initiative. Um, to get our children, our black and brown children laptops. There's a lot that's not being said here. And there's a lot that's not being represented here. And that's the black and brown people that is disproportionately happening to. Disproportionately, these children that we are talking about, these families that we are talking about are black and brown. But yet, I'm the only black woman on here right now. That's disturbing to me. I do not like to witness other people talk about things that's happening in my community, that's happening to me. I am a grandmother of a four-year-old autistic, nonverbal grandson who got no services when this happened. I have no soft words, Ellen. I have harsh realities. The DOE is not doing their job. For them to sit here and tell you they don't have data for this, they don't have data for that, I don't need data. I live it. I have lists that are overflowing with children that do not have working devices. That's why we as a community have decided to do it for ourselves and to scrape our little bit of pennies together during COVID to get our babies technology, the first thing that they need. The second thing, Mark, um, Chairman, supplies, school supplies been a hundred dollars or more before this pandemic. And we are leaving out parents on fixed incomes. What about parents with disabilities? What about parents that live on social security? Do they not count? Do we not care about them? Do we not care about how they are feeding their families, how they are dealing with children with special needs and can't get the, the resources that they need? I think that if we're going to succeed and we're going to change things, we cannot leave out the people that are the center of the hurt, that have been hurting. This is nothing new to us. So make sure that we are included in the conversation, because I will. Thank you, Chairman Trigger. Thank you. And next, we will hear from Amber Decker. If we could please unmute Amber Decker. Buck is ready. Hi, thank you so much for letting me testify today. Can everyone hear me or, yeah? Okay. Um, I, I just wanted to echo um, what was just said. I think that uh, you know, I, I'm working with families all the time. I, I'm actually shocked to hear that there are students with autism in District 75 that are in class sizes of six and eight. Half of them are 
on remote. So you have the class size of two or three in person. And, you know, you have these students coming in one week and then the next week they're without any option for in person. And my understanding of autism and my own personal experience having an autistic son, that is creating a Jekyll and Hyde effect of students that are one minute doing doing okay and then the next minute they're not you know and i don't understand how the cdc guidelines can't be adhered to in a class size of two or three it makes absolutely no sense um a class size of six to one and eight to one and 12 to one that is cut in half because half of the students have opted in for remote should absolutely be offering every student that that well, every family that wants blended in-person services should be able to come in person if they are in a self-contained setting. And I, I've yet to hear how the DOE can justify um, not serving the most vulnerable population here or the most impacted population here. Um, there's only 17 to 20,000 students in District 75. So, uh, you know, we're all still waiting to, to hear how this is, how this is going to uh, affect these students long term and what DOE is going to be offering uh, to them without them having to exercise their rights. Thank you. Thank you. And next, we will hear from Paulette Healy. If we could go ahead and unmute Paulette, please. Talk is ready. Paulette, you're unmuted. Hi, um, we actually just lost our Wi-Fi connection because there's construction going on right outside our house. I've, I'm on my data right now. Can I put Lucas on first? Would that be all right? Uh, Chair Traeger says, go ahead. Okay, go ahead, buddy. Um, hello, my name is Lucas Healy and I go to a D75 school. I wanted to say hi to my friends, Councilman Traeger and Councilman Brandon. And my and <clears throat> Miss Christina and Mr. John. Miss Christina was my first principal when I started kindergarten. I didn't I did not know too many words then. Thanks to thanks to my D seventy five school, I can read eight books that I love and and count money. E and now I'm using my Chromebook, but I'm afraid it's disconnected. <laughs> it and okay. Um, I uh, I like a pro. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I was so happy happy when I could uh, go oh, for a. Uh, in person speech in the summer, but when the school started in September, or the buildings were not safe. Safe. It's because of the virus. Yes, my school's whole buildings means was was closed because of positive cases. Is but my. My teachers were still forced to go inside. Also, even in it, if the buildings things were, were safe, I could not, not go oh, without a school bus because as my school is not, not in my distress. Yes, I go oh, more than one hour to get to school. That is why I I am here. Here to ask you, who city councilman, and to please support more RD75 E75 programs so I can continue learning. And, I will be starting starting high school at September, Ember, and and I do not have have many choices. Yes. my sis, sister who 
who is not in in D seventy five. I can and can and go to to a high school, uh, in in my community, but but I can't and because as that program does not exist yet. Yet, in in my distress, is it's not fair that and there are are lots of kids who who need programs like like the d75 knife and i wanted to keep learning i sh i should not i shouldn't have could not have traveled so far to to go to school oh well, thank you for, thank you for giving me this time Lucas Healy signing out. So, first of all, Lucas is a superstar. Lucas, I am so proud of you. Um, it you 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 are speaking to an, uh, to a very broad audience. It takes courage and guts to speak so powerfully and so effectively. Uh, and you are speaking not just on behalf of yourself and your family, but on behalf of thousands and thousands of kids and their families. So I want to say as a former teacher, and I'm still a teacher, I give you an A plus, Lucas. You are <laughs> awesome. I am so proud of you. We are so proud of you. And I want to give a virtual Zoom round of applause for your extraordinary work. And we're with you and we're gonna keep fighting for you and for your family and for all of, of, your, of your classmates. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lucas. And we'll, we'll hear from Paulette, if Paulette's there as well. Yeah, uh, I'm here, Councilman. Paulette, Jordan. Paulette, just give me one second while I rename you, please. Thank you. Lock is ready. Okay. Uh, greetings, esteemed council members. My name is Paulette Healy. Oh, Paul, I am oh, a- Okay, go ahead. Your name's now changed. Go ahead. I'm so sorry. Uh, okay. Greetings, esteemed council members. My name is Paulette Healy, and I'm a council member on the Citywide Council on Special Education, a member of Press NYC, and Lucas Healy's mom. Uh, I want to commend Deputy Chief Academic Officer uh, Christina Foti and her team for their leadership and continued responsive engagement with our council and our special education community. You personally have gone above and beyond any DOE agency to engage and actively listen and problem solve the issues presented to you. And for that and for you, I will forever be grateful. That being said, we have heard how frustrated our city council members are with the failure of the DOE to offer concrete data about things such as attendance, device distribution, teacher shortage numbers, and class size. We know of students who have not been able to attend school even to this day because a bus para still has not been assigned and are being told if they remove the para from their IEPs, their child can get on the bus. We know students not only still waiting for a learning device, but also assistive technology because they are nonverbal, therefore cannot benefit from live instruction. And some parents who are still waiting to conclude their assistive technology evaluations that were initiated pre-COVID. Children are being sent into schools anticipating in-person services and only receiving teletherapy in the classroom. What sense does that make? Our students with disabilities have not been prioritized in this poor excuse of a school reopening. And unlike the summer, rec centers were not available for our essential workers who have children with disabilities who are struggling to find childcare supports. The guidance the DOE is putting out is not being implemented on the ground level. We advocates have been saying this for years, that this top-down approach is not working, and this pandemic has put a glaring spotlight on that. And as Laura Podbesker had mentioned previously, our families are faced with a daily struggle between paying for Wi-Fi so their children can continue to learn and put, or put food on the table. Also, just to note, busing contracts have ballooned to over 1.56 billion so far, which is 31 million more than it cost in 2018, 2019. Time is expired. May I finish my thought? Oh, go ahead. Yes, go right ahead, go ahead. Yes, yes, please. Um, and that does not include the acquisition of Reliant for countless millions more. When every penny counts, this kind of spending feels outrageous. So I am here to urge the council members to please your collective power 
to institute universal broadband for all in order to address the digital divide that prevents our children from a free and appropriate education. I urge the city council to really look at how our DOE is using this money, this little itty bitty money that has been allocated to address the inequities that are going on in our schools. And I urge the city council to support more programs like the D75 program, like the ASD Nest program, like the ASD um, Ames program, which there are only 90 seats in the entire city, but has, has shown data that it, it works. And when you go into early intervention and provide those supports early on, these children learn. I urge city council to look at programs like Gordon Gillingham and Will Wilson's contrary to the ones that are being used now, because that is learning by science, that is reading by science, that is literary literacy by science, and it's proven to work. And if we can't get our children to read, then what good are we as parents and advocates? Thank you so much for the time and thank you for allowing my son to speak today. Thank you, Paulette. And Lucas is awesome and you're awesome. And we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna continue to fight like hell uh, for our kids and families. Thank you so much, really appreciate you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Jessamine Lee. If we can go ahead and unmute Jessamine Lee, please. Box ready. Hi, uh, my name is Jessamine Lee. I am a uh, parent and PTA president at PS84 in Brooklyn and uh, an SLT member and a former DOE ESL teacher. Um, one of my children is a fourth grader in the ASD Nest program at PS84. And um, before I begin, I want to just say thank you to Chairman Traeger for pointing out the artificiality and the manufactured nature of our uh, staffing crisis that we find ourselves in. It didn't need to be this bad. And I feel like our children and our educators are being used as pawns um, in our mayor's, frankly, our mayor's attempt to look for his next job. Um, that said, I'd like to move on to um, the remote portion of blended learning. That is to say that, you know, the DOE withdrew any requirement for schools to provide synchronous instruction um, on blended learning days. And the ripple effect of that is that every kid in an ICT class who is a blended learner is not receiving their mandated co-taught periods per week. And as you push the DOE to report not only whether or not students are underserved, I urge you to find out how underserved they are because it goes beyond whether or not kids are receiving their related services. If they're not receiving their co-taught instruction, they're not receiving their education. And the other thing I wanna mention is that, you know, the DOE is not being transparent about assistive technology. I am here now over 11 months after putting in a request for an assistive tech evaluation for my child. Request went in in October, 2019. The um, evaluation occurred remotely last July, which was a ridiculous process. Um, and I don't know how a parent who doesn't enjoy the privileges I do could have possibly facilitated that remote evaluation. Mandate was made, IEP meeting, was um, is in, may, I, may I finish? Yes. Yeah, thank you. The IEP meeting was delayed because the, um, honestly, the scheduling restrictions caused by teachers being pulled in so many different directions leads to an unavailability of and, and sch scheduling IEP meetings is essentially impossible. Had the IEP meeting earlier this month, got a call saying that, you know, unfortunately, the, my daughter's Chromebook has been, is, you know, has been requisitioned, but is back ordered until some time, you know, to be determined. And the sum total of this is that this was a problem before COVID. My kid should have been hooked up with her device in February, 2020. And, you know, this is just emblematic. This situation is amplifying and exacerbating the DOE's systematic disregard for students with disabilities. And, you know, we need to shed, shed more light on this and find out exactly the scope. And before I finish, I just wanna say that, you know what, the DOE has not done anything to address the truncated services offered last spring due, you know, as implemented through the remote learning plan. Related services were cut in half and the DOE has no plan to address those deficiencies or issue RSAs. Thank you for the time, I appreciate it. 
Thank you. And that concludes this panel. I'll turn it to Chair Traeger and Chair Ayala if they have any questions. Uh, Councilmember Ayala. I don't have any questions, but wanted to thank Lucas for coming um, to testify today. Uh, thank you. We're so proud of you. Uh, we thank everyone uh, that testified on this panel. We will now move on to the next one. For the next panel, we will be calling Katrina Feldkamp from uh, Legal Services NYC. We will be calling Charlotte Pope, Girls for Gender Equity. Kimberly Olson, New York City Arts and Education Roundtable. Jennifer Rodriguez and Young Se Bay. And we will go ahead and start with Katrina. Thank you, Chairs. My name is Katrina Feldkamp, and I'm an education attorney at Bronx Legal Services and a member of the Healing Centered Schools Working Group. My testimony will focus on a subset of students with disabilities who've been particularly impacted by remote learning, students with trauma-related behavioral and emotional health challenges. Childhood trauma impacts one in four students nationwide. Since COVID, many students, particularly black, brown, and poor students are experiencing trauma like the loss of loved ones, isolation, and family economic loss at frighteningly high rates. My office represents these students. The disabling impacts of trauma affect all aspects of their learning, their ability to process and retain information, their ability to engage with educators and peers, and their ability to develop social emotional skills. The pandemic has exacerbated these challenges as students' mental health worsens and as remote learning limits their access to mandated supports and services. Our schools are ill-equipped to support students with trauma. Often they respond to trauma in ways that neglect students' needs, punish students for their disabilities, or take actions that traumatize students and staff alike. If schools continue to take this approach when they fully reopen, we will see disastrous results. That's why we're calling on the DOE to adopt a healing-centered approach across all schools. Healing-centered schools train their staff to understand the impact of trauma and engage in a process of whole school change to adopt healing-centered practices inside and outside the classroom. These practices reduce behavioral challenges, suspensions, and staff burnout. The DOE has taken early steps towards this change, but we must take greater action now if we want schools to be prepared to support students with trauma and behavioral disabilities. We commend the DOE for adopting staff-wide training on trauma-responsive educational practices, a training we recommended, but these trainings won't have an impact unless the DOE prioritizes healing-centered practices and invests time and existing resources to help schools adopt this model. We would appreciate the opportunity to discuss healing centered schools with your committees. There is time to plan ahead and to be proactive. We urge the DOE to use it well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge for the record that we were joined earlier by Council Member Salamanca. Uh, so next we'll hear from Charlotte Pope, Girls for Gender Equity. Doctors ready. Thank you, Chair Traeger, Chair Ayala, members and staff of the committees. My name is Charlotte Pope and I'm speaking on behalf of Girls for Gender Equity. We wanted to raise issues of school climate with the framework that actual or perceived disability has served as a driver of surveillance, discipline, policing, and punishment for girls and gender expansive youth of color and the young people we work with. In prior school years, thousands of students were forcibly removed by police and hospitalized under the category of child and crisis incidents, disproportionately targeting students with disabilities. When we look at the NYPD reporting for the spring during remote learning, we do see child and crisis police removals from regional enrichment centers. We've not heard a commitment from the DOE to discourage this practice during a school year that must be focused on healing and care. And we're demanding that no student in emotional distress or crisis be responded to with police during in-person learning. We also know that in New York City schools, students with disabilities are more than twice as likely to be suspended than students without disabilities. And we're calling on the DOE to immediately withdraw pending or proposed suspensions from the previous school year. And while we disagree with the use of last year's discipline code this year, the guidance on facial coverings we've seen from the Office of Student Health does clarify that expectation of mask wearing should quote, not lead to new conflict. We recommend that the DOE explicitly prohibit suspensions related to compliance with public health measures and ensure that students with disabilities receive positive behavioral supports instead of discipline or removal to remote only instruction. Thank you again. 
Thank you. And next we will hear from Kimberly Olson, New York City Arts and Education Roundtable. Ready. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and for your leadership and commitment to equity in our schools. My name is Kimberly Olson and I come to you today as the Executive Director of the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable and also as a teaching artist who has taught theater in District 75 and ICT classrooms throughout the city. Is it possible to increase the volume? I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing. I, I apologize. Sure thing, I can also talk louder. I'm here to highlight the importance of ensuring that students with disabilities participate in rich arts and arts education services. This can be accomplished by one, continuing partnerships between New York City cultural organizations and our public schools, and two, maintaining certified arts teachers to en and ensuring that they're assigned to teach in their licensed artistic discipline. Without thousands of additional teachers to staff in-person and remote classes, arts teachers are being reassigned to teach non-arts subjects. Delays in contract approvals, cuts to arts partnerships grants serving students with disabilities at over 300 schools, and unconfirmed arts education budgets at school and central levels are preventing cultural organizations from continuing longstanding partnerships. Arts are disappearing from their classrooms across the city as students need them the most. The Roundtable is a service organization who builds its efforts around the values that arts are essential and that arts education is a right for all New York City students. For students with disabilities, the knowledge and skills development gained through the arts can play a critical role in their overall success. Critical because the arts offer unique opportunities for students to develop awareness that broadens their perspective, celebrates their differing talents and creativity, and encourages their acceptance of others. In addition, all of that to helping students meet their IEP goals, supporting their healing, and positively impacting their school attendance rate. And yet, as schools grapple with a year of remote and blended learning, many are missing this essential piece of their curriculum. On behalf of the Roundtable's membership of over 120 organizations, we request City Council's help in preventing schools from stripping away resources from our students with disabilities to make up for budget shortfalls. The arts are essential in our schools now and forever. Thank you. Time is expired. And next we'll hear from Jennifer Rodriguez from the New York City Charter Schools. Clock is ready. Oh, Jennifer, just one moment. We just need to unmute you. Sorry. There we go. Uh, um, can we unmute Jennifer Rodriguez again, please? There okay. we go. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Traeger and members of the Council Committee. My name is Jennifer Rodriguez, and I'm the Inclusive Education Specialist at the Collaborative for Inclusive Ed within the New York City Charter School Center. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. The Charter Center and the Collaborative work to support charter schools to ensure they can effectively serve students inclusively and equitably. During this tumultuous time, we have continued to emphasize the need to prioritize our most vulnerable students as schools move forward. We have also consistently partnered with the DOE to discuss how special education policy changes during COVID are affecting special education students affecting public charter schools. As a special education teacher and administrator for over a decade in both district and charter schools, I'm deeply committed to the idea that access is a right and needs to be protected. Especially during this time of remote learning, we are emphasizing the need for student-centered instruction, multiple entry points through universal design for learning, and trauma-informed practice that supports student social and emotional development. We would applaud any efforts the city made to expand mental health services and advocate that all communities be included. We admire the city's creation of the Learning Bridges program and would advocate for charter school families who are a vital part of the New York City community to be included in this effort and all efforts aimed at supporting families during this critical time. While charter schools are autonomous in many aspects, the DOE is the LEA for special education in New York City, which means all decisions about the provision of special education services for charter students are made by the DOE's Committee on Special Education. We appreciate the DOE's efforts around the introduction of teletherapy for related services during remote learning. Unfortunately, the data around charter school special education services continues to not be reported. We would like to reiterate that charter students are public school students, and we respectfully request that the same data that is available on district school special education services be made available to parents and the community about the provision of special education services for charter school students. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. 
Thank you. And our final panelist for this panel is Young Se Bei. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Young Se Bei, Executive Director of a Community Inclusion and Development Alliance, CIDA, uh, located in Queens, New York. Uh, we are a grassroots organization and parent center that serves Asian American families uh, who have uh, children with a disability. Uh, I may have to repeat uh, whatever um, the, everyone has said already. Um, I have a particular testimony regarding the communication um, between the schools and the DOE. Uh, the Asian American families who have uh, children with a disability, especially those uh, who have a significant disability and mental disorders, uh, this has been unbearably uh, difficult time, uh, especially those uh, who have language barriers. In this midst of chaos, the most pressing issues are communication between the families and the school regarding the remote learning. Uh, and unfortunately, as many parents already address, this is not a brand new issue. Um, the feeling of a hopeless and becoming um, much deeper and profound across the community and many families and gave up on their children's making progress during this year. Uh, I would like to believe the DOE's uh, presentative's uh, response on the uh, students are making progress toward their, uh, you know, annual goals, but it's really not happening on our ground level. Um, secondly, the families are very confused about the IP goals, uh, how that will be implemented, how the progress is measured, and how the goal for the next year will be developed based on the current situation. The DOE website, as you know, everybody uh, shared at the beginning of this uh, the conference meeting, the program adaptation document pad, which is supposed to be delivered to the families by September 21. We found that many families still don't have the pad or RAD. Um, just last year, uh, night, uh, we had a short family meeting and then spread the chat uh, meetings uh, with the 97 Korean American family members. No one has received any pets. So, um, you know, we do understand this is a very difficult time, then we should expect changes, but it would be great that uh, DOE shares uh, what parents should expect, uh, you know, based on this remote learning situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Chair Traeger. That concludes this panel. If you or Chair Ayala have any questions. <clears throat> All right, thank you to this panel. We will go to our next panel. And on our next panel, we will be calling Lori Hannon, Anna Fridman, Debbie Bruckman, and Leticia Romaro. And we will start with Lori. Who's ready? I'm ready. Okay. You may begin. Okay, thank you, um, Chairs Traeger and Ayala and the council people for putting this all together. In this, I'm an Arise Coalition member, but I'm speaking today as a parent. In this city, ever since the lockdowns began, children with disabilities are having their federally guaranteed rights to a free and appropriate public education violated. They're suffering and regressing and their families are suffering with them while we try to work and teach our children. My son, Adam, is autistic. Adam and his seven autistic third grade classmates at PSMS 219 in Queens are a few of these children struggling through inaccessible online instruction and inconsistent access to a classroom and therapy schedule that works for them. I share our story here so that you will finally hear their voices. Adam and his classmates attend a program for students with autism called Horizon, um, one of the ASD programs. They are not in District 75. There are many students, um, the Horizon offers specialized instruction and a self-contained class of eight within community schools. There are many students like Adam who attend restrictive non-district 75 placements in community schools. And these students and programs have really not be con been considered in the reopening plans or discussions and we feel like they've been forgotten. Without system-wide special education reopening guidelines from the mayor and the DOE, decisions about special education have been left to individual schools, sometimes with unfortunate results. Adams principal chose not to apply for an exemption for them to attend school full-time despite their need for this and despite the fact that there's space in this school. Other Horizon programs did apply for and were granted this exemption. Adam's principal told us that in his judgment, the Horizon students did not warrant any special consideration relative to other populations in the school, despite their significant disability. Our children happen to have a wonderful teacher. They have their related services, but they cannot learn remotely. 
With our family story in mind, I make the following recommendations about special education during this unprecedented time. Students with disabilities who have such intensive support needs uh, that they require a self-contained placement of 12 or fewer students, just one second, should attend school at least four days a week. The DOE needs to help to set up system-wide guidance on this. Our horizon, um, our kids with autism are not okay and remote learning is not working. Just ask any of the parents. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. And next we will hear from Anna Fridman. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Anna Friedman. I'm a mom of three special needs uh, boys. Uh, they're all autistic, nonverbal. Special education has been nothing short of a uh, disaster. Since remote learning has not worked at all for us, we were very excited when the school has reopened. Um, and we were really hopeful that the UE will start following the children's IEPs, providing speech, OT, PT, and ABA services. But once again, the DOE showed us the parents uh, that they could care less about our children's needs and they do not need have they do not feel the need to follow their IEPs. Um, we were informed that not everything on the IEP will be followed because there's shortage of providers. And then again, our schools got shut down because we were in the red zone. And special needs children are to home again. Once again, my children were left with no services whatsoever because they're not able to participate in remote learning. Um, I'm not sure how DOE, our governor, our chancellor, do not consider um, special education as an essential service. Our children need special education and being in school and routine to survive and thrive. Um, I really am begging people to consider special education as an essential service and think of our children and what we could do better for them. Um, thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you. And next we'll hear from uh, Debbie Bruckman. Time starts now. Let's unmute Debbie. Hi, um, thank you so much. My name is Debbie Bruckman and I have two sons in public school. One is in 11th grade who is neurotypical and I have uh, my younger son in eighth grade is with ICT meaning inclusion with two teachers um, per class. ICT or the inclusion model is a long proven success uh, for both my kids. Unfortunately, due to the steep need for more teachers during the pandemic to accommodate two schools in the school, remote and blended, the DOE is not providing fair and equitable education for my children with ICT placement because there is simply no ICT happening. So. MS-447, where he is in Brooklyn, is an all-inclusion school. We are currently missing 37 teachers to run it as an inclusion school. None of my children, none of my child's classes are being taught by two teachers together. Instead, he is taught often with one general ed edu uh, education teacher on a Zoom with up to 27 students, and many of those students have disabilities. So instead of having a special ed teacher modify in real time during the class by forming small groups or presenting information visually or repeating or reframing, I can report that my child is lost, um, as are the other kids on that Zoom, despite that really high caliber of gen ed teachers. It's not their fault. The 20 minutes of office hours, which we've been offered a day, um, to make up for what they didn't learn is not enough time to every meet, meet with every single subject matter teacher, right? So exponentially, they've all fallen behind in every single subject. So the truth is my kid has gone from an honor roll student at math and science who loves school to a struggling student with sadness and lost confidence and frustration and anger. I have never come to a city council meeting ever in my life. This is something new for me, but I need to bring this to your attention. By not providing ICT with two teachers, his access to education has been diminished. We know how to educate these kids with autism and dyslexia and physical disabilities and audio processing disorders. I'm gonna take a little more time since I was muted in the beginning and other learning challenges, 
but we are missing the teachers needed to accomplish this. So I would just like to point out, this is illegal. This is a federally mandated IEP not being followed. I don't care what the DOE says. It's morally wrong, and it is so disappointing because it's a system that works. And I want to shout out to the heroic staff that F MS447 staff is doing, trying to help those just 150 kids there with IEPs, with ICT placement. They are rock stars finding Band-Aids in the air. So please help the city hire more special ed teachers, listen to the principals, they know what they need. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much. And next we'll hear from Leticia Romaro. Time starts now. Can we go ahead and, uh, there we go, yeah. you're unmuted. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, Council Members Traga and Ayala and the members of the committee. My name is Leticia Romaro and I am the parent of a special needs child. I'm here today to keep my promise to my now deceased son, Robert, to continue to fight for those students who have special needs. Fighting is a common theme for families of special needs children. We fight for virtually everything they need and against preconceived bias. The last place we expect to have to fight in the is the Department of Education, the largest, most talented education organization in the world. But alas, here I am. The children in District 75 are children in small classrooms with powers for a reason. They need one-on-one -on -one attention and they become agitated, disoriented, and anxious whenever their routine is disrupted. Dr. Chen and Ms. Fodi know this, as does everyone on this panel. So what made, so who made the decision that blended learning would be helpful for these st students? District 75 parents, Annette Reyes says, her son Joseph is having toileting accidents, throwing tantrums, and isn't sleeping at night. Marie Farrell's daughter, Elizabeth, becomes agitated at the sight of an iPad. She can only tolerate a minute, and that minute upsets her so much it takes the whole day to calm her. Francis Gravity's son, Gavin, screams and has outbursts. His mental health is deteriorating. Diane Glinskaya's son, Michael, is self-injuring, banging his head against the wall and stomping his feet so hard that the landlord is asking them to leave when their lease is up. Depression, regression, and severe anxiety is the new normal for District 75 students. That is unacceptable. We must get our District 75 students back into their classrooms immediately. We must provide in-person services such as speech, OT, PT, and counseling. And if we can't, we must provide RSAs. We understand the monumental task you face teaching children during a COVID pandemic. We also know that parochial schools and daycares and schools outside New York City have been getting it right. Please, you are the largest uh, depart educational department in the world with talented principals and teachers. You can get it right. We can help you get it right. But you have to start delegating responsibility to the principals who know their community best. Uh, thank you. And I actually forgot one person on this panel, so my apologies. But next, we will hear from Kaveri Sengupta. If we could please go ahead and unmute Kaveri Sengupta. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, sorry, one moment. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Kaveri Sengupta, and I am the Education Policy Coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, the nation's only Pan-Asian children and families advocacy organization, leading the fight for improved and equitable policies, systems, funding, and services. Thank you very much to the chairs and the members of their committees for giving us this opportunity to testify. The Asian Pacific American or APA population comprises over 15% of New York City and over 1.3 million people. Many in our diverse communities face high levels of poverty, overcrowding, uninsurance, and linguistic isolation. Yet the needs of the APA community are consistently overlooked, misunderstood, and uncounted. We are concerned about the most marginalized within our community, particularly our 15,138 APA students with disabilities who are both over and underrepresented in special education classrooms, depending on their diagnoses. There is also a large representation of Chinese speaking families in District 75, which serves our most high need students. First, we need the city to provide accurate data collection and disaggregation of data on students with disabilities, specifically to better understand the unique needs of APA students and L students with disabilities. Among other examples, we do not know the locations of L students speaking APA languages who have IEPs. 
were also in the dark about students with IEPs who are not ELLs but could still be from limited English proficient families. This lack of knowledge on zip codes, neighborhoods, and languages results in families continuing to remain uninformed about services that they have the right to access. We remain unable to meet our families' needs. Second, the city must provide more multilingual evaluate, evaluators and service providers who are able to communicate with families in their languages in a culturally responsive way. There has been a persistent lack of multilingual evaluators and providers, and we need proactive systems providing interpretation and translation. The city must prioritize outreach to families. Simple availability of resources by no means guarantees that families will be aware of their existence. The longer families are denied access to bilingual evaluations, the harder it is for them and their children to catch up, particularly I'm during fired. COVID. Uh, can I finish? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, moreover, if children do receive an IEP, families may be unable to understand them. In the wake of the pandemic, we've heard from organizations whose clients have been unable to access an evaluation for a disability and are therefore unaware if their children need an IEP. Many are not even aware that such an evaluation exists. These families may be recent immigrants and the compounded experiences of navigating a new country, handling COVID and figuring out how to access special education services, which is an already complicated process, are incredibly challenging. When we don't inform families about their rights, we deny them services that they are legally entitled to. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and that concludes the testimony for this panel. Chairs Traeger or Ayala, do either of you have any questions? Okay, do any council members that are still with us have any questions? Seeing no hands, um, it appears from my list that we have no more panels. I know people have been, um, some people had issues before with Zoom dropping in and out. So if there's anyone that we have not called on, if you could please use the raise hand function in Zoom right now, we will call on you to testify. and not seeing any hands. Um, it looks like Chairs Ayala and Traeger, we have concluded all public testimony for this hearing. Um, and I will just note for the record um, to remind everyone that the Education Committee will be back November 18th for a hearing on social emotional needs um, as we look at the reopening of New York City schools. So Chairs Traeger and Ayala, I will turn it to you for closing statements. Uh, thank you, Malcolm. Um, this is a very, sobering this is this is a very this is a very difficult hearing um and we have a lot of work to do and we don't have time um and as i mentioned earlier and i want to just acknowledge uh the, the work of my co-chair council mariala who i've spoken with a number of times during the during the pandemic and also recently again about the needs of our kids. Uh, we, we have a great leader and a great chair in Council Member Dan Ayala. I'm very proud to work with her and learn from her and all, all of my colleagues. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is not a game with the administration. No one's looking to score points. No one's looking to, this is, this is about the kids. You know, as a teacher, I remember every decision I made in that class was about centering the needs of our children, all of our children. And the reason why we need this information is to better fight for them. And uh, we just don't have enough information right now. And quite frankly, I think we're hearing further evidence of an indictment of this blended learning model, which is really not meeting the needs of children who, need, who, need, who just need more, who deserve more, who are entitled to more, legally entitled to more. It, it's not working. And that's why I mentioned earlier, the mayor should put ego and pride aside and immediately revisit this model and rework it, revamp it to provide more in-person options and services for children and families who need it the most. It's just, this is just not working. This, these are, I think someone mentioned before about, I think it was to the credit of, of Tanisha Grant, I wanna thank her publicly for her powerful words that this is not, just data, this is what people are living through every single day. This, and, and as a teacher, I know that when I taught a regents class, if a student missed one or two days of instruction, that was a lot. Kids missing weeks and months of instruction. This is, this is generational folks. This is not just temporary. This, this carries on for the rest of their lives. And that get, this is generational now. And so we need to immediately 
respond and deal with this crisis. And as I mentioned earlier, we will use every tool that we have in, 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 in the council toolbox. We don't have much power because of mayoral control, but we have the power to force them to report data. And if they don't do so in a timely, timely fashion, as we, as we did earlier, we reserve the right to issue more subpoenas to get information immediately on behalf of our students and our families. So I wanna just thank uh, my co-chair, my colleagues, the incredible staff. I wanna give another uh, virtual applause to the staff of the city council, my staff, the central staff, they are incredible. They work very, very hard on behalf of, of the public as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to my co-chair, the, the awesome council member, Diane Ayala. Thank you so much, co-chair. Thank you, Council, um, council Member uh, Traeger. I um, I thank you for uh, for allowing us to to jointly host this hearing today because it was really important um, to me that we do so. Um, I remember us speaking a few months ago, and it was the moment that I realized that there was an assumption that once school uh, went into virtual. A setting that all children would automatically be equipped with the technology that they needed to successfully do that. And when I realized that that was dependent on the level of technology available to them at each school, my heart sunk because I knew instinctively that that meant that the children that I represent, that my children in my community, and that children in communities that look so much like mine, um, were not really receiving the level of education that they deserve because they did not have access to this equipment. And so um, coupling that with the needs of children with disabilities, which require a more specialized level of education, um, it's really important for us to highlight these issues and um, to really um, work with the administration to rectify them. And that is why, you know, I was really disappointed to hear today's hearing that, you know, there wasn't much data available to be provided, even though even though the request was made um, days ago um, to ensure that the, that the information would be available to everyone that was watching here today. So I, I hope that we're able to get that information as soon as possible. And I'm happy to share that um, so that we are all on the same page about where we stand in terms of uh, access to uh, to resources via technology, and also I'm really curious to hear back on the uh, staffing ratios and um, what that looks like by borough um, and by district. So thank you again, and thank you to everybody that stayed um, and everyone that came in to testify. This was, I think, a really valuable um, hearing, and and I I hope to be able to come back with some more positive news in the near future. Thank you, Councilmember, and with that, we will.